Good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to the evening version of Assembly Joint Assembly Ways and Senate Finance. Committee Secretary, will you please call the roll? Senator Canizero. <coughs> Senator Dondero Loop. Here. Senator Gorkachia. Senator Harris. Senator Neal. Here. Senator Wynn. Here. Senator Severs Gansert. Here. Senator Titus. Here. Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Bacchus. Present. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Gorlo. Here. Assemblyman Hafen. Here. Assemblywoman Howdigi. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblyman Miller. <laughs> Assemblyman O'Neill. Assemblywoman Peters. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Assemblyman Yeager. Here. And Chair Monroe Marino. And I am here. Will you please mark Senator Canizero and Assemblywoman Peters as excused absence and Senator Harris and Assemblywoman Hadegi present as they arrive. <clears throat> Members. As I stated this past Saturday, we, when we began this conversation with the 15 smaller rural and frontier county school districts, the superintendent's accountability meeting is what I hope and plan to be a regular update from each one of our districts on their goals, plans, and challenges that they face to our joint fiscal committees during future legislative sessions. As legislators, um, leaders, we, continually are asked questions from our constituents who are also the constituents of our superintendents of concerns of how they spent their COVID dollars um, in each district, the policies that they have in place or are being discussed concerning classroom size, educational resources in the classroom, extracurricular activities, repairs and or disrepairs of our schools, staffing levels, vacancy numbers, and the compensation of our teachers and educational professionals as well as our educational support staff in each and every district. And most importantly, what is their plans for this historic amount of money the districts will be receiving this legislative session? We definitely understand that every district is unique in size and makeup and the challenges that they face. Um, but the best way to address what those uniqueness are is to ask the questions directly to the district leaders themselves. So tonight, we'll be hearing from three districts. We'll be hearing from our Charter School Authority, Washoe County School District, and Clark County School District. Um, members, I encourage you, um, following the presentations, to ask questions. I know it's a Friday night, but it's not bright and early on a Saturday, so you got to love me. <laughs> right? Right? And I fed you dinner, so you really got to love me. Um, <laughs> So with that, we will get started with the first district on our agenda, and that will be our charter school authority. And I welcome you to the table. And as soon as you're settled, you may get started. Good evening. My name is Melissa McAdam for the record. And as you know, um, Director Fiden has had her baby about 10 days ago. So you are going to be stuck with part of our A team and me, the B team. Um, I am Melissa McAdam. I'm currently the chair of the SPCSA board. And I have served on that board since its inception in 2011. Um, my day job is that I am the director of Oasis Academy Charter School in Churchill County. With me at the table is um, Ryan Herrick, General Counsel for the SPCSA, and Jennifer Bauer, Director of Finance and Operations. Before we begin today, I want to provide a brief overview of charter schools sponsored by the State Public Charter School Authority. There are currently 43 charter schools 
charter school contracts with charter school governing bodies. We often refer to these governing bodies as charter holders. Some charter school, school governing bodies oversee a single campus and others oversee multiple campuses. So combined, these 43 charter holders have a total of 78 campuses. Our charter schools are located in five counties, the majority of which are located in Clark County. As of October 2022, the SPCSA sponsored schools served just under 60,000 students, making up just over 12% of the state's public school enrollment. <clears throat> First, we want to begin with some context about how state and federal funds flow to charter schools. The majority of charter schools funding flows directly from the Nevada Department of Education directly to each charter school. This includes all the funding in the per pupil centered funding plan, the adjusted base funding, the local special education funding, and the weighted funding. In addition, the state special education funding is distributed directly from NDE to schools. Finally, while the major annual grants go through the state public charter school authority, there are some state and federal grants that go directly from NDE to our schools, such as the 21st century grant. The charter school sponsor, the SPCSA, is responsible for administering, administering certain state and federal grants, only those funds throw, flow through the SPCSA. For these grants, the SPCSA allocates funds to schools, reviews their applications and budgets, and then submits a compiled application and budget to NDE. Once the SPCSA's application and budget is approved by NDE, the SPCSA is then responsible for reimbursing schools for their expenditures under the grant and in alignment with their approved budget. With regard to the charter school budgeting process, Chapter 388A of NRS dictates that the charter school must adopt its budget in accordance with NDE regulations. The NDE regulations outline a timeline and process for budget adoption. First, by April 15th, charter schools must prepare a tentative budget and submit that tentative budget to NDE for the upcoming school year. Then in May, the charter school must have a public hearing on the tentative budget. Finally, by June 8th, the charter school's governing body must adopt a final budget for the upcoming school year. That final budget must be submitted to NDE, the Legislative Council Bureau, and the sponsor, in this case, the SPCSA. I think it's important to reiterate here that PCFP funding flows directly from NDE to charter schools and that charter schools budgets are adopted by charter school governing bodies. These budgets are not subject to any approval by the SPCSA. So the information we are presenting today is in information we have gathered from our charter holders, but ultimately it is their governing bodies that will approve the school budgets. In addition to the SPCSA, NDE, and LCB receiving information about a school's budget prior to the school year beginning, charter schools, like school districts, are required to report on their revenues and expenditures as well as have an independent financial audit conducted following the close of each fiscal year. Charter school financial audits must be conducted by a CPA or accounting firm that has been approved by the committee to oversee charter school audits and the audit must be conducted in accordance with the government auditing standards. The fiscal year closes on July 1 and the audit must be completed by November 1st. Then the audit must be presented to the charter school's governing body within 30 days. And ultimately, the audit must be approved provided to NDE, the Legislative Council Bureau, and the sponsor, in this case, the SPCSA, by December 1st. In addition to the audit, each charter school is required to submit an annual report on their budget following the close of the fiscal year. This report includes actual revenues and expenditures from the prior year. The report is due by November 1st of each year, and it is submitted to NDE, the Legislative Council Bureau, and the sponsor, in this case, the SPCSA. 
So to recap, statutes and regulations outline the process by which charter schools governing bodies adopt their budget in advance of an upcoming fiscal year and require charter schools to provide reports on their budgets. Once the fiscal year ends, the financial audit must be conducted and the charter schools must submit a report on their budget. All of this information goes to NDE, the Legislative Council Bureau, and the sponsor. Finally, as you know, charter schools are funded similarly, but not exactly the same as school districts. Charter schools receive either the adjusted base or statewide base per pupil funding, depending on whether they are brick and mortar or virtual schools. Charter schools also receive local special education funding based on prior years, and this varies by charter school. Charter schools also receive weighted funding based on the school's population. However, Currently, charter schools are excluded from auxiliary service funding. <clears throat> On the right side of this slide are the numbers that have been provided to us regarding the state statewide base and adjusted base funding according to the governor's recommended budget. Note that the other funding categories will vary by school because they are based on school level factors. Next, we'll shift to federal emergency funding charter schools received. <clears throat> Between CARES, CRISA, and, the, and ARP Acts, as well as AB 495 from the 2021 legislative session, charter schools received approximately $95 million in federal emergency funding. SPCSA staff is working with the schools to ensure they have the ability to obligate all ESSER II funds by September 30th of this year. Subawards for AB 495 funding will be issued next week. <clears throat> Across all of the emergency grant programs, charter schools have applied and received approval for over half the funding to support staff, salaries, and benefits. Charter schools have also invested a significant amounts of funding in technology and contracted services. Now we'll discuss charter schools' plans for use of additional funding. Given that each charter school is responsible for its own budget, the SPCSA has collected data from all of our schools to understand their plans and priorities for use of additional funding. First, we ask each school how they plan to spend their funds. The graph above shows how many schools indicated they would use additional funds towards each category. Many schools identified multiple priorities, for example, a school may have said we want to invest in additional teaching positions, professional development, and increasing pay for our current employees. We have 43 charter holders or charter school boards, and most schools are represented multiple times on the graph above. <clears throat> In addition to asking schools what categories they plan to invest additional funds in, we also ask schools what percent of additional funds would be used for each category. This graph shows the average percent of additional funding the SPCSA sponsored schools plan to spend on each priority. To summarize, there are some clear trends around where schools plan to invest additional funds. The majority of charter schools, more than half of the 43 charter holders, plan to use additional funds towards increasing pay for current staff or positions, as well as hiring additional staff, including teachers, paraprofessionals, counselors, and, and or social workers and support staff. We also see that on average, the largest amount of funds are expected to be invested in increasing pay, hiring additional teachers, and hiring additional paraprofessionals. Now I know a lot of nuance gets lost when we aggregate data across 43 charter holders. 
The next seven slides provide more of an, a deep dive into seven unique public charter schools, including a few large urban schools, an approved alternate high school, a small urban elementary school, a rural school, and a virtual school. I know you have a lot to get to tonight, so I will not take the time to review each one, but we felt it was important to provide these examples considering each school's unique design, location, and individual governing bodies who will ultimately approve these who will ultimately approve these planned expenses. <clears throat> Before I close, I did want to address, after watching last Saturday's hearing with the rural superintendents, we noticed that you had questions regarding students and their social emotional health. The SPCSA, along with Carson and Washoe school districts, is participating in Project AWARE. The goals of Project AWARE include increasing awareness of mental health issues among school-aged youth, providing training for school personnel and other adults who interact with school-age youth to detect and respond to mental health issues, connecting school-age youth who have, been, have behavioral health issues, including serious emotional disturbance, to serious mental illness, and their families to needed services, and finally, to develop state and local infrastructure to expand and, to, and sustain an exemplar, integrated, multi-tier system of support in pilot schools. Additionally, each charter school has initiatives in place to meet the needs of their students. Lastly, you had questions around student outcomes associated with past and future expenditures. We are very proud that despite COVID-19, our schools have continued to make academic gains. 80% earned 50 or more points on the Nevada School Performance Framework. 55% would be rated a four or a five star. And 22 of the 24 high schools exceeded the statewide grad rates. These outcomes indicate our schools have effectively used SR funds and give us confidence in their ability to make prudent decisions regarding proposed additional funding. And with that, we will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, and I believe we have a few questions for you. We'll start with Speaker Yeager. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here on a Friday evening. We very much appreciate it. <clears throat> um, obviously, you are uniquely situated, and I appreciate the effort that you went through to actually talk to the schools individually about uh, where they would uh, likely spend the funds. So I just want to say thank you for these graphs. I think they're helpful. And then um, I haven't looked through all of them yet, but I like that you broke out different schools to kind of look at uh, what their what the context is and what their funding priorities might be. So I guess here's the question. So looking at the budgeting process, understand that process and it looks like the final budget obviously gets transmitted to the LCB but gets transmitted um, uh, to, to the governing body as well. And so I just wondered, would there be a way to go back like after those budgets are finalized and sort of match up the budget with what the responses were in terms of like what the schools are thinking now versus how the budgets actually get enacted. And so just, I hope that question makes sense, but I wanna be able to see, you know, were there changes in those proposals and then hopefully be able to match that up with performance data that we have as well. Melissa Mackinnon, for the record, I think that would be our plan, but I don't think that there's any of those processes have been fine tuned yet, but it's very much in line with the practice of what the SPCSA does with our schools right now. And just a quick follow up, Madam Chair, and, and really not a question, but just a, a comment. I, I mean, I think that would, that kind of data would be really helpful. Obviously every district is different and you're very different in terms of managing. So um, would love to work with you on that as we get closer to that process and would love to be able to come back and see, um, you know, where the money was spent and if changes were made, why they were made that way. So just again, appreciate the level of attention and detail that was put into this presentation. I know we asked a lot of you in a very short period of time and very much appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I'll remind you, each time you speak, you have to state your name for the record. I know it's repetitive, but it really <laughs> helps with our record keeping. I'll go to Senator Gansert next. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here today. Um, I just want to follow up on the speaker's comments. I think that's a great idea to provide us some of the, the outputs or the outcomes as far as how they use that money. And then also, um, right before you ended your presentation, you talked about some of the outcomes as far as how the schools would rank and the graduation rates, but I didn't see that in the packet. Would you mind, is it there somewhere, or do you want to follow up with like a one-pager that tells us about performance of the charter schools? That would be very helpful. Absolutely, we will get you that. Inf Melissa Mackin, for the record, we will get you that information. Thank you. 
Assemblywoman Bacchus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I kind of have a question back on page 10 of your slides regarding um, the approved use of the funds um, from the federal COVID monies, whether it came from SR1 gear, SR2, SR3, or AB495. Um, um, I noticed about 60% of the funds were used on salaries. And um, I was curious if those salaries were utilized to secure additional positions to help um, students, um, whether it was summer school or after school programs, or if those additional funds were utilized. Um, and I know this is hard because you have to think about each of the schools, and I didn't see it on the subsequent slides. Or if it was used like as re retention bonuses or um, additional compensation. Melissa Mackinan, for the record, it's a combination of all of those. So, I mean, I can talk directly, you know, to my school. We hired some new positions. We used the money to retain positions. So I think it's, a, I don't think, I know it's a combination of everything you said, uh, the percent varying from school to school, how they did that. Thank you. And Madam Chair, may I ask a follow-up question? Um, and then also when I was going through, I'm kind of feeling like a little um, different from the weekend we spent here. Um, mm -hmm. I was looking at each of the schools, and one of the things I did not see, and this may have been the use of those 60% of federal funding um, during this time, but I didn't see anywhere where any of the charter schools were having like large vacancies or difficulty, difficulty filling those positions. And so I don't know if you have a sense of if there is, in fact, a vacancy rate for our educators and or paraprofessionals. And then um, if you know what schools are doing to recruit um, their educators and paraprofessionals, that'd be great. Melissa Mackinan, for the record, I can't address what schools are doing to recruit, but I can tell you that the total number of charter school teachers is 2,922. And as of November 6, we had approximately 200 unfilled FTEs across all systems. Assemblywoman Anderson. I know this microphone. Thank you. And thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. It's kind of hard to, to think about all of them together in a group, so I, I greatly appreciate the conversation we had out in the hallway about the um, restorative justice practices and, and, and how many schools are doing that on their own, the one-to-one -one training. My question, though, also kind of goes along the same ways as assembly member uh, boxes on page nine. When you're talking of the money that was, um, that was awarded to the different charter schools, and I just don't know the process of what happens if that money is not, in fact, spent by the end of the time frame. Does it, because uh, like if you look, some of them have only spent uh, for let's say the SR2 funds, there's one or two uh, Leadership Academy of Nevada, let's say they've only spent 77% of the money given or some of the other ones, 59% um, down at Somerset Academy of Las Vegas. Does that money revert back to the charter school or does it um, authority or does it revert back to another entity? Melissa Mackinan, for the record, I'm gonna ask um, Ms. Bauer to answer that question. Good afternoon, Jennifer Bauer for the record, Director of Finance and, Op Finance and Operations for the Charter School Authority. All of the emergency grants are on a reimbursement basis, so no funds will revert per se. However, there could be the opportunity for unspent funds and dollars left on the table. So uh, you have touched on a very sore subject for us. We do not want that to happen. So uh, my entire grant unit is undertaking a huge effort to personally outreach every school make sure that they have a plan to spend all of their awarded dollars. If they don't have a plan, do they need an amendment? We've run an amendment so that they can change their budget so that they can spend all their dollars. And then if at last case or worst case scenario, they still can't, then we would reallocate to schools who can. Great, thank you so much for that clarification. And then I again have a follow up to another question that was asked with the 10% vacancy rate. I just want to make sure I've, I've got it correct that the licensing, licensure of um, educators for, this, for the charter schools are in the core area of, of education. And so some of your teachers might not, in fact, be licensed. I didn't know if you wanted to go into that or not or just didn't know if that's also um, one reason why there's a 10% FTE unfilled. 
Um, okay, so as a reminder, statute does require at least 80% of teachers at each charter school to be licensed and also requires teachers of core academic subjects, English language learners, and special education to be licensed. Unlicensed teachers must, one, complete a background check, two, hold a degree, license, or certificate in the field in which they are a teacher, and three, have at least two years of experience in that field. That said, Every single one of our charter schools licensed teacher rate far exceeds 80%. Generally, an unlicensed teacher is someone who's coming in and teaching taekwondo, uh, ballet, something along those lines. Chair Don Loop. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here this evening. So I have a couple questions, and they're kind of on... 10 and 12 a little bit. So on 12 where we have approved use of funds and you have web-based programs and software, books, supplies, equipment, and then it jumps down to textbooks, supplies, information, technology related. I see some crossover there and so I was just wondering if you could explain if those are all, I just want to make sure those are all student-based or are those some things that are not student-based? Um, because when I look at the funding priorities, like with technology, I see it's sort of in the middle of the pack of what you're doing, and yet a lot of these touched technology services. So I was just trying to sort of get, a, get an idea where that f fell. The vast majority of that, J Melissa McAdam for the record, the vast majority of that is um, one-to-one -one tech and keeping that cycle going for schools. So, so one-to-one -one tech, I think, would be book supplies and equipment. Is that where that would be? I, I can't say for sure how every charter school answered that. I know, Melissa McAdam, for the record, I know we answered that in regard to technology being uh, re refurbishing uh, like Chromebooks and, for students. Okay, and then what would purchase property services be? So per, that include so purchase property services. Miss Bauer, do you do you know off the top here? Okay, so that's what I thought. It's a lot of times it's contract. Like for example, you, Melissa Mackin, for the record, if your um, sanitation services aren't employees but they're third uh, party vendors. Okay, thank you. I was just trying to get an idea of you know, where you were with the one-to-one -one technology. Um, and of course, we all know that we're gonna have um, programs that we use on that technology. And, um, you know, you ha like I said, you had books, supplies, equipment, and then two below that, it says textbooks. So I, it was like books were in two places and technology was in two places and supplies were in two places. Uh, Melissa Mackin, for the record, I, I apologize if that was confusing. Um, I think the difference between books and textbooks, they're, they're, my general understanding is there are a specific amount of money that we need to spend towards textbooks generally, and so they kind of get sorted out differently than, than some other books might. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I had a question. So it's going to be two questions. How often do you review the school performance plans that the um, schools actually produce? Melissa Mackinan, for the record, we uh, charter schools are on the same cycle as other schools. So there are multiple under the new process at NDE. I think believe this is the second or third year that we've been using that process. There are multiple required check-in times um, throughout the year, and we submit that information not only to our boards, but um, we upload it to the SPCSA as well. Okay, thank you for that. And so my follow-up question is on Nevada Virtual Academy. So I don't know if you have updated data, but I was I went into the uh, NDE portal, and it looks like the most recent data that there's about 14.9% that are actually proficient. I don't know if that's grown, and, and their weakness is in math, not ELA. And so when I looked at their target, they're targeting they have, they want to spend their money on this targeted intervention in reading, but really their weakness is in math. It looked like there were 63% that were below approaching standard, unless you have updated data. 
Melissa Mackinan, for the record, I don't have any additional data, but we will include um, performance data with, uh, as we said earlier. So what we can get you that, but I don't know their data off the top of my head. I apologize. Okay. Because uh, my follow-up, quick follow-up to that, if you're going to add any additional information, um, is how do you guys um, address whether or not their target is appropriate and then go in and review uh, what's actually happening? Because if you base, if you look at their list of what they say their needs are, um, it's very generic. Melissa Mackinan, for the record, ultimately, um, we don't approve their budgets. It's their boards who approve those budgets. So where we would come into play is if they were underperforming and they weren't meeting expectations on that side of it through our academic performance framework, that's when we would address those issues. Thank you for that, because that's why I was asking, because if 14.9% being proficient isn't underperforming, then I must find a another thought process around no, that. Melissa Mackin, for the record, it is underperforming. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Assemblywoman Brown May. Thank you, Chair, thank you. Um, first, I have to go on the record as saying I have a student teacher who is currently at a public charter school. Okay, but she is really growing into that role. Um, for me, I, I really wanna talk a little bit about um, our IEP students, and I did not see a lot of data here. If I pull the student counts listed online for 2022-2023, it looks like enrollment for IEP students totals 5,883 kids across all of the uh, all of the different schools. And so, if I compare that data to how we break down some of the nationalities, right? So we have 23,000 Hispanic kids in charter schools. We have 4,777 Asian, um, 17,000 white, so 7,500 black kids. We have 5,883 students on individualized education plans. Now, I personally think every kid should have an IEP, right? Um, but our special kids in particular, especially as we look at weighted funding. So I'm curious to know if you will talk a little bit about, do you have any data or plans relative to how our special education students are equitably treated throughout the charter schools? Melissa Mackinan, for the record, I'm not 100% sure I know what you mean by equitably treated. Um, I mean, I can tell you that our charter school or our students with disabilities um, data, that number is consistently going up every year. Um, I can tell you that that subgroup, and we can include all the performance data, um, but I can tell you that every subgroup, including IEP students, um, they're outperforming proficiency in third through eighth grade um, SBAC scores as well as in the 11th grade ACT. Thank you. I'd love it if you would include that data. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I believe this is our last question. Assemblyman Miller. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all. So um, I'm going to ask a couple of uh, questions here. Um, and I'm going to ask all the remaining districts tonight to go ahead and try to include um, your responses to uh, these questions. And really, it's going to be mostly about mental health of our students, um, mental health of our staff um, within the system. So you mentioned the Project AWARE, um, and you also mentioned that each one of your schools has, I think, additional um, supports and things like that within the schools. Um, could you just share a little bit about what those look like um, and what type of, uh, what you're spending um, to address your mental health issues? Thank you. Melissa Mackinan, for the record, we can get you some more specific global uh, charter information. I can tell you specifically, I can just talk about my own school. Um, we have, through ESSER dollars, we were able to bring on a third counselor, making our student to counselor ratio 250 to one. We also additionally um, were able to use ESSER dollars to bring in tier one mental health supports for our students that were the most in need. Um, additionally, we've, we, we were doing this pre-COVID, so this is just coming out of our general fund. We contract with a third party vendor that comes in and does not only mental health awareness with our staff, um, 
and, and helps them individually, but also does PD through that that they can use in their classroom. So every single one of our classrooms is required to um, do mindfulness at least once a day. Um, so those are just a few of the things that we do at Oasis Academy, and we will be happy to get you, you know, some more specific information. Again, I'm just talking about one out of 43 schools here. So great, thank you. Yes, that would be um, that would be helpful to have uh, some just additional information, and then. How are you, um, if you can give me a um, kind of a picture of, of what the mental health situation looks like. So when we heard from a lot of the other districts, we heard that there were, you know, some very significant challenges um, and things that they were facing, even in trying to address them. So I'm just curious if you can give us a, um, a, a picture of um, how things are and, um, yeah, thank you. Melissa Mackadon, for the record, um, again, I can address my school in Churchill County, Nevada, and I can tell you that the situation is dire. We only have 700 students, just over 700 students at our campus, and the week before we went on spring break, we had two students um, in a mental health facility who had attempted suicide. I dealt with a suicide situation on Safe Voice last night, so this is a matter of grave concern. I, I, I felt every feeling that those superintendents, the, that emotion that they had, I felt that in my very core. So the situation is serious. Um, and we are looking for competitive grants to like, we're, we were using ESSER money. Like we've run out of our tier one, like we had a licensed clinical social worker who was coming in to provide those tier one supports. Although we use those dollars up very quickly. So we are doing everything we can as a school and we will use some of our, uh, uh, some of these additional funds to help fund um, some of those tier one supports. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, and we do have a few more questions. Assemblywoman Kasama. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I'm looking back at um, page nine and one of my colleagues, kind of asked a similar question, but I just happened to look at the uh, Somerset Academy where under the ARP Act funds, only 42% has been spent of 7.8 million. That means you have about $4 million left to spend with a very limited time. And are, are you aware of what their plan is? I know these are all individual different schools, but it just, and I know you said you want to make sure they all spend it, but like that's, that's a big one there. It, it seems like that would be hard to meet the deadline. Melissa Mackin, for the record, I obviously have no information about what Somerset plans to do, but may, maybe Ms. Bauer does. Jennifer Bauer, Director of Finance and Operations, for the record. I also don't have all 43 schools memorized. However, um, I can tell you that this, this table on slide nine is a compilation of many grants under the umbrellas of ESSER 1, 2, and 3. So when we look at the ARP Act and we look at colloquially ESSER 3, that's technically a first round of funding because it was, around, it was awarded to us from the Department of Education in two rounds. So there was the first two thirds of funding then there was another round of the final one-third of funding. Then there's also some after-school grant funding and some other opportunities as well for homeless and neglected youth and that type of thing. So it's a compilation of many grants, and some of those grants were recently awarded. So in all fairness to the schools, some of those grants the schools haven't even actually had a chance to seek reimbursement on. But I can tell you, nevertheless, just the same as ESSER 2 with ARP ESSER, all the grants, our goal is to spend as much as possible and we have hired extra grants analysts in my grant unit to ensure that we have that level of ratio of support to the schools to be able to provide that outreach to ensure that if they need to amend the details of their budget so they can spend more money or if it needs to be reallocated, we will do so um, and we'll be doing the same thing next year for ARP. Melissa Mackadon for the record. I'll just add one thing to clarify. That September 30th deadline is only for ESSER 2 funds. So a a lot of that money, I mean, the bulk of our money was through ESSER 3, right? So a lot of that outstanding balance, that September 13th deadline is not applicable to. Did you have a follow-up? Assemblywoman Kasama? No? 
Okay, thank you. Senator Don Gerald. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I have a couple follow-up questions um, from some of my colleagues as well as they were kind of my questions as well. One of them is, is there an actual number of students that can attend uh, each charter? Melissa Mackinan, for the record, yes, every charter holder um, in their contract specifies the number of students that they are allowed to have in their charter. They cannot go above or below 10% of that number without seeking a charter amendment from the State Public Charter School Authority Board. So if it was a, just for my clarification, so if it was a large, you, you might be an individual school in your case, but if it was a large charter and they had several schools under them, would that number be inclusive or would that number be for each school? Uh, Mr. Herrick, is it by, by campus or is it by overall charter holder? Ryan Herrick, for the record, I believe that is by campus, but let me get back to you to confirm that. It's interesting. We do amendments all the time, and I should certainly have that at, the, at my fingertips, but I don't. But I believe it's um, campus-specific. But if I may elaborate, we've sort of seen that issue, too, because, again, if you have a, a school with 100 kids, the 10% is 10 kids one way or the other. Somerset Academy has almost 10,000 kids spread across nine campuses, so 10%. We, we've looked at potentially adding a number factor in there or somehow making it because, again, the 10% differs depending on how many kids you have at, at the campus. And that's why I'm asking. Yes. Thank you very much. And then follow up, Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'd like to know is, with that being said, the number of students. So we talked about the percentage of teachers, and you were sort of indicating that a lot of the teachers that aren't certificated may ve very well be a an ballet teacher or something like that. But my, my concern, I guess, comes in to, while I recognize that, um, in, in a public situation, in a public school, I may very well want a ballet teacher to come in, but I still have to have a certification. Or if I want a mariachi teacher, I still have to have a certificate. So I guess um, my concern is, is while, while I understand that, um, I, and I always say this, with all fairness, with public money comes public accountability. And so it's always a concern of mine because I am a certificated teacher. And I, can, I have to keep my certificate valid, which I just renewed it, um, because I can't go teach without it. And even you said, you know, our core subjects have certificated teachers. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to match in my brain why, why we would need to have people that weren't, didn't have certificates. Melissa Mackinan, for the record. So let me be clear. I have that number right in front of me. I should have shared it before. Of the 2,922 teachers in the SPCSA, 43 of those are unlicensed teachers. So it could be very similar to, I know you've heard a lot about this in CTE programs, right? We, we, provide, we offer welding at our school. So that is someone that is a master welder. He has an endorsement in that area, but he may not have a teaching license. So those are the kind of examples, and that's why it does say they have to hold a degree, license, or certificate in the field in which they are working and have at least two years experience in that field. And while I appreciate that because we are so short on teachers, I would still say that in a public setting, we have to have certificates. So, um, And so with that, um, my other question, which is very near and dear to my heart, is mental health. And so I didn't, I wasn't really clear where your mental health dollars were and, um, and exactly how that process was moving through because there are lots of different schools. And once again, in a, and, and I can only refer to my public setting, and that is in a school district, um, in a large school district or a small school district, it wouldn't matter whether it was White Pine or uh, Washoe County, they have to have a plan and they put money towards it and they have some specific things that they are doing. And so I'm not seeing that in here. And um, I've done quite a bit of mental health work um, with education and, and teens and what have you. So I was just wondering if you could address that. 
Melissa Mackin, for the record, I obviously, again, we can get that information from you. I don't know what every charter school is doing in that regard. I think where it falls um, under the charter school funding priorities is with the additional counselors and social workers. And um, you can see that 27 of the 43 charter school holders um, plan to use funds in that way. Um, and then I think that also fell under a lot of professional development for many of those schools. Mr. Herrick, did you want to add something? May I follow up, Senator? Yes. Ryan Herrick, for the record. I believe Assemblyman Miller has asked the districts to pull some of that information. So we're, we're in the process of pulling that school by school, charter by charter, of where those mental health dollars are going, whether it's social workers, counselors, psychiatrists, and whatnot. So we should have that to the committee um, in the next soon. Okay, thank you very much, and, and I'll stop here, and uh, if I have another one, I'll raise my hand. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblywoman Gorlo. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for being here. I wanted to talk a little bit about the lottery process for students to um, get into the charters. I know we've had conversations last couple of sessions about certain groups having like weighted um, ability to be chosen. Um, we've talked about them being neighborhood schools, so children that are in those neighborhoods get preference over people that live across town. Would you still walk me through that process? I can't wrap my head around. Is it a computer program that little Johnny got put in four times because he met different criteria? Um, are you picking balls out of a little barrel? How are you actually doing this? Melissa Mackinnon, for the record, each school administers their own lottery, um, and we have had many schools who have opted into the um, weighted lottery system that you're describing, and some schools, Melissa Mackinnon for the record, I apologize, um, they, um, some schools it's a two to one ratio, so if, you, if you're a qualifying student, you know your name is in the bucket, if you will, two times. Um, in some schools it's upward of four or five um, times the weight. Um, and different schools do it different ways, so we can get you that information. I believe the majority of those are computer computer generated. May I follow up? Sorry. So Ryan Herrick, so remember with a lottery, if you have an enrollment cap of 750 kids at that school, if you only have 720 kids apply for that school year, you don't run a lottery. Everybody gets in. The lottery only comes up, so if you have an enrollment cap of 750 and you have 751 kids apply, all 751 kids go into that lottery. It's typically computer run. I don't think we have a single school that runs it by hand. Um, and then again, if you have certain weights, and most of them, if it's, if it's an at-risk or a free and reduced lunch rate, it's, it's upwards of four or five um, to one, um, get extra weights. And then those kids that are selected um, through that lottery that are enrolled. And, and again, there may be one other nuance here. There may be um, open seats in second grade and fourth grade, but first, K first, third, I forget what, which grades, I, may, may be full. So it would only be those grades that, that, that have open seats. And then again, back to my example of 751 kids. So that one kid that didn't get in the lottery then goes on the wait list. The first seat that opens during that school year in that grade level, that student would then fill that seat if they wanted to. I, I hope that helps. <clears throat> yes, that, that does help. Thanks. Thank you, members. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you so much for the presentations. And a number, a number of our members had requested information to be sent to them. Please send that to our committee manager and the manager can get that out to every member on the committee. Thank you so much and enjoy your weekend. With that, we will close the presentation from our State Public Charter School Authority, and we will invite Washoe County School District to the table. Good evening. It's good to see you. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Susan Enfield, proud superintendent for the Washoe County School District, here for the record, and I am joined by our trustee president. I will let her introduce herself. Hello, my name is Beth Smith, and I'm the president of the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. We are also joined by four members from our Washington Education Association, Stacy Stosich, Robert Munson, Maggie Babb, and Liz Cadigan are behind us here. We're grateful for them being here as well. 
Washoe Education, sorry. That was bad. I came from Washington State where it was the Washington Education. So off to a stellar start. The Washoe Education Association. We're grateful for their partnership and for their being here. This is the last day of our spring break in the Washoe County School District. So we are not joined by other staff because I hope that they are off enjoying the last of their well-deserved break. So uh, President Smith and I will be carrying the water here. And with that, we will start. Go ahead. Oh, it's not going up there, it's just there, okay. So uh, our goals for today, we want to begin by uh, providing you with some context just about our district and then go into some specifics around how we are strategically investing the state funds that are being proposed for the upcoming biennium. So this is our, this is our student population. Uh, as you see, the majority of our students are Hispanic. We are um, growing in our diversity, which we think is a tremendous asset for our school district and our community. We have roughly uh, 9,000 students who come to us speaking a language other than English. I want to make a note here that we really do our best to use student first language. We don't like to reduce our students to labels. I don't think any family wants their child reduced to a label. So uh, we will talk about our students who come to us speaking other languages. We will talk about our students who come to us experiencing homelessness. And as you see, we just have a, under 9,000 who come to us needing special services and uh, roughly 34,000 who come to us relying relying on us for some or all of their meals during the day. Our graduation rates were on a steady climb. The pandemic certainly um, hit, uh, we hit a blip there, but we are proud to say that we are back on the climb and continue to, and expect to see that rise continue in the years ahead. And now we'll talk just a little bit about what our base per pupil funding is. Uh, right now, our, uh, you will see that our per pupil funding is expected to increase from just over 7,300 to over 8,800 in fiscal year 24, um, which equates to approximately over $92 million in increased general fund revenues for the Washoe County School District. We, however, have to take into account some very specific costs that will be taken off the top of whatever that amount actually is, step increases, PERS rate increases. Um, we are experiencing declining enrollment as other districts across the state and country are, and there is a cost with that. We are also at the same time um, having to open a new school based on where our student population is, is concentrated right now. So the projected net surplus of the funds that we are expected to receive is approximately $76 million. The weighted funding that is being proposed, and again, I'm not going to read through all of this for you. I know you can read it yourself, but you will see that uh, we will see some increase in the funding for our English learners, for our at-risk funding. The area of concern for us is around the funding for our students with special needs. Uh, as you all know, uh, the we get a about 13% of our total special education budget comes from the feds, the federal government. About 35, 36% comes from the state. Over 50% comes out of our general fund to meet the needs of our students who come to us with special needs. And I know that President Smith is going to speak to our at-risk funding as well. Thank you, Dr. Anfield. Beth Smith, for the record. Something that we do want to bring attention to on this slide is the proposed new formula regarding at-risk students. So as it stands right now under the current formula, Washoe County has 18,000 students who qualify for that additional funding to support them. Under the proposed new formula, that same 18,000 would be reduced to only 5,000 students. All 18,000 of those students, however, will still need that support and those services. So we just wanted to raise that with you, that that new funding formula uh, reduces the number of students who receive that help, but doesn't really reduce the number of students or children that actually need that support. Susan Enfield for the record. And again, the only other um, uh, check mark we want to put next to that is the proposed increase in funding for special education will not nearly come close to the additional funding that we would need from, from the state. So as you will all, you all, I believe, have copies of our legislative platform, uh, the trustees, myself, our Washoe Education Association, and all of our other labor partners are in agreement that um, investing in staff is our top priority. Um, it has been a few years since there was a state-funded cost of living 
um, increase, and that was only 3%. We um, have had compensation studies conducted, and we know that our staff in the Washoe County School District is somewhere between 20 to 30% below market value, and I can tell you that that goes across all levels of the organization. So that goes from our teachers to our aides to our principals to our senior administration. And so we want to be clear that when we talk about investing in our staff and increased compensation, that is for every person who works in the Washoe County School District. It is not limited just to teaching staff. Thank you, Beth Smith, for the record. A couple things I'd like to add on this slide is that the Board of Trustees took the unique position of actually including in our legislative platform the value that we have for our personnel's salary and compensation. We believe that our staff should be compensated as the professionals that they are. Um, I would also like to point out that the Washoe County School District takes another unique approach in recognizing the demands that our staff is facing right now. We actually compensate our teachers counselors, and other select staff when they are serving uh, caseloads higher than average and also class size ratios higher than average. And I do believe that that is a unique approach. Susan Enfield, for the record, and before going to the next slide, point of privilege and pride, the picture on the top is of our Nevada State Teacher of the Year, Connie Hall, whom we are very, very proud of. And if you, you are all, by the way, um, you have an open invitation to visit classrooms in our district anytime. All you need to do is let me know, and I can tell you it would be a joy um, for you to see what happens, the magic that happens in her classroom. So now, let's talk about what the fiscal impact of these cost of living increases that we are looking at will have. So uh, with a 10% cost of living increase, that would equate to approximately $46 million, leaving us with the actual 76, with about $29.7 million to, to spend. If we went with a 15% COLA, however, that would take us almost up to $70 million, leaving us with roughly $6 million for other priorities and expenses. I think it's worth noting here that even with a 15% COLA, that will not bring my first year teacher salaries up to $50,000. And so a starting teacher in the Washoe County School District makes $41,000. The last I saw, the median home price in Reno was 550000 That math doesn't equate. And I can tell you that um, it is uh, a point of continuous uh, pain for those of us in the district. Just as an aside, I was out to dinner just a month or two ago. And as I was leaving, a wonderful young woman followed me out saying, Dr. Enfield, Dr. Enfield. She was the hostess at the restaurant. She said, I, I'm a third grade teacher at da 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 da. And I said, oh dear. I said, and you're doing, you're doing this in addition. So rather than home, lesson planning, resting, spending time with the people that she loves, she was doing another job not to save for a ski trip. It was because she was getting her master's in education. I hugged her and I apologized. And I said, we are going to do everything we can to make sure that you don't have to continue to do this. And so this is, this is a, a priority that President Smith, the trustees, our bargaining associations, and I feel incredibly committed to because our children are worthy and deserving of the highest quality and most competitively, competitively compensated staff that we can provide them. And so putting this in context of our budget process, obviously us coming to you right now is a bit premature to say the least. We are in the beginning stages of a very participatory budget process that goes on for months. Um, it's about, it's not just my decision. I don't get to decide where the money goes. It's not even just President Smith's decision. So we actually go through a, a pretty um, lengthy engagement process with staff, community members. Um, and then of course we won't know until June what the final decision is from the legislature. So we're all doing this pending sort of information that we are are waiting on in the months ahead. Is there anything you want to say on budget process? Um, the, Beth Smith, for the record, the only thing that I'll add on this is that, of course, we will also engage our collective bargaining units. And so the numbers that we're showing and what it is that we're suggesting are just projections and also just ideas. Correct. Thank you. The other big um, uh, X factor here is that we are also in the midst of a strategic planning process. So this is also a very participatory process that we're that is engaging stakeholders from across our community. We have approximately half a dozen different planning teams consisting of staff, of families, of community members who are coming together to identify what our goals and our values, our, sorry, our goals will be for the next three to five years um, based on the values that we have as a school system. We intend for that to be adopted by the board 
forward in June. So by the end of June, with the legislature coming to an end and with our strategic plan, we will have a very clear roadmap of how we'll be allocating the state funding that we'll be receiving. So now we want to talk a little bit more about the strategic investments with these state funds that we intend to make. So I think it's important. There's a lot of discussion. I've heard it in, in watching you, and of course we know that it's also out in the general population around how districts have been using their ESSER dollars, their federal relief funds that we started receiving during the pandemic. And so I wanted to provide you with what that looks like for Washoe County. So ESSER won, that was the first round, and, and that really went to the basic uh, things for survival, PPE and sanitation and all of those things that we had to do in those early days. Those dollars have been completely expended. Um, Beth Smith, the record, I do want to point out that this is not in your packet, but it is in our updated presentation, and we'll get you this information immediately after. Thank you, President Smith. Yes, uh, sorry, Susan Enfield, for the record. Um, we will get you a hard copy of this, but we felt it was an important um, graphic for you to see and for the public to see. Our ESSER $2, that was $34 million. Uh, we have uh, expended over 80%, and we've obligated another 14.6%, uh, which gives us about a million dollar remaining as of January 2023. And the last round of ESSER, ESSER 3, is $77 million. We've expended about 36%, and while it says only 12% is obligated, um, we have actually preliminary plans for a much higher percentage of that that we will be bringing forward to the trustees in the months ahead. I can guarantee you that we will spend every penny of those ESSER dollars, and when I say spend them, I mean invest them strategically and wisely in ways that benefit our children and our staff. But we are definitely on track to do that, and I want to share with you a little bit of where those dollars um, have gone. So again, strategic use of our ESSER dollars, learning acceleration and recovery. We are in the very beginning stages of recovery from the effects of the pandemic. So we've used these dollars to invest in high quality curricular materials that our students need. We've used them to invest in 24 seven um, on demand tutoring for our students. They can log on with the company that we've provided at 11 o'clock at night and get someone on chat to help them with their calculus homework. If you have teenagers at home, I'm sure you would have appreciate someone who's available at 11 o'clock at night to help them with their calculus homework. Um, so investing in those things that we know will help our students um, continu continue to catch up and to continue to excel, to excel, excuse me. Um, we have also um, looked, we have also used these dollars to invest in a district-wide um, growth measurement so that we will be able to share in the coming years very clear data on where our students began the year and where they ended the year. We think this is incredibly important. The reality is that the Smarter Balanced Assessment doesn't really give us great information. At the end of the day, what you want to know, what every parent wants to know is my student started the year here. Where did they end the year? And if my students started fourth grade reading at a second grade level, and they get to the end of the year reading at, not, at almost a fourth grade net level, but not quite, they've made a lot of growth, but they, it's not going to pass that smarter balance test, we need to be able to show that. Similarly, similarly, if your fourth grader comes in reading at a fifth grade level, you should expect that they'll be reading at a sixth or seventh grade level. This is about you know, measuring our students' growth wherever they are in the learning continuum. And we felt that was a very important investment for us to make as a system. And Beth Smith, for the record, what I would like to add here is that the Washoe County School District are very faithful stewards of our taxpayer dollars. In demonstration of that, we very recently received five commendations from the Nevada Department of Education, specifically around our strong use of these ESSER funds, all related to student outcomes and the success of that. Thank you, President Smith. Susan Enfield, for the record. The one last thing I will point out here is, again, I'm not going to read through every bullet point, but um, working for working toward class size, reduction, class size reduction in our lower grades has also been an incredibly important use of these funds. Looking on our second sort of strategic use of ESSER bucket is on student well-being and family supports. And uh, I know that the questions, questions around mental health have come up, and so I'll try to weave some specifics into this, even though they're not necessarily ESSER funded, to get to some of those questions. We've just invested in um, a strategic security system, which is basically a crisis alert button that all of our staff will have. So if something is happening in their classroom or their building, they press a button. It goes automatically to the front office if they press it multiple times, it goes to the central office and law enforcement. So that's not prevention, but it, 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 I think it 
I think, will provide our staff with a higher sense of security that they know if something happens that we can get help to them quickly. And that means a lot. Our staff are telling us they need to feel safe in our schools, and it's our responsibility to provide that. Additionally, additionally we've while we haven't wanted to um, use our one-time ESSER dollars for ongoing salary costs, we certainly have invested them in high-needs positions. So looking at substance abuse counselors, more mental health administrators, um, looking at family resource center specialists. So what are the ways that we can help, um, you know, in the time that we have these dollars, provide additional um, highly qualified staff to meet the needs of our students. I will also say this, we have recently not using ESSER dollars, um, we have partnered with an organization called Care Solace, where a student, a family member, a staff member, anyone can log on and identify what their need is, if it's substance abuse, if it's suicidal ideation. They will be connected with someone from Care Solace, who within three days will have um, connected them with local providers that also accept their insurance. Um, we think this takes down the barrier for our staff, our students, and our families to access the supports that they need. Um, and it's also, we're doing this also in partnership with our broader community, and we believe that our community partners across the county are going to also see how we can together make this available to everybody across the Washoe County area, not just the school district. The other thing I do want to say around mental health, however, is it's not just about our students, it's about our staff. As I said, we are in the, I, I, I know that it feels like we are very much back to pre-pandemic normal when we go out in the world right now, but we are certainly not in our schools. Our schools are feeling every day the effects of the pandemic. We see it in the escalated behaviors of our students. We see it in the fatigue um, and the frustration of our staff who aren't do, who don't have all the tools they need and want to meet the needs of those students. So as we you know invest in the mental health supports for our students, and making those resources more readily available. We are also partnering with organizations. We'll be surveying our staff to see what their biggest um, mental health needs are. And then we will be, we've secured um, uh, support from the Pure Edge Foundation and Mark Brackett out of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence to come in and really work with our staff on the neuroscience of the effects of stress on the body. We're not talking about self-care anymore. We're not even talking about just social emotional learning. We're actually going to talk about the effects of stress on the body because if, when we have students with escalated behaviors, adults can't de-escalate if they can't self-regulate. So I say that to say that we need to be investing in the mental health and, and um, well-being of our staff and teachers as well as our students, and we are doing that. And finally, strategic use of ESSER dollars are our educator supports. Um, we've used these dollars to strengthen our leadership pathways. We want our staff to see that there are opportunities for advancement within the system. We were already investing heavily in professional learning communities, time for staff in a building to collaborate, looking at student data to change their practice to improve outcomes for students. Um, we've provided scholarships for aspiring special education teachers, incentive programs for substitute teachers. So really talking through with our staff, what are some of the ways that we could provide these supports? And while we did not use our ESSER dollars for a tremendous amount of ongoing salary support, we did use um, some of those dollars for incentives. Do you want to speak to that? Yes, thank you, Beth Smith, for the record. Um, so they were uh, COVID differentials, and we did uh, we did a, um, compensate our staff uh, for the additional work that they were doing, which really honestly goes far beyond what we were able to give them. Um, but we did recognize it was what they deserved and particularly at an unprecedented time. And um, that is something that we did a couple different times during the pandemic um, in terms of compensating our staff with those COVID differentials. Thank you. Susan Enfield for the record. Now we um, actually want to talk a little bit about the areas that you all identified in some of the questions that you sent us about what we will be using our state funding for uh, when it comes to meeting the needs of our students. I will just uh, say that remember that if uh, we do determine that the trustees do approve and in working out with our, our bargaining units a 15% COLA that only leaves us with about 6 million to really put towards some of these things. So we're going to have to get creative. But these are the areas where we feel we would get 
the highest level of return on investment in terms of student outcomes. So um, for our low proficiency rates in um, reading math and science, we're looking at purchasing high quality curricular materials. I'm sure that some of you have heard about the, um, the science of reading and all the conversations about how are we teaching children to read. Um, we know more than we knew a while ago and we have to act on that. So we're making sure that we're providing those materials and the training for our teachers and staff to do that. Um, we are also looking at providing additional on-site support in our highest need schools. So our students with the greatest needs, um, providing them with additional opportunities. We've talked about tutoring. We also are looking at extended learning opportunities in the summer, as well as credit recovery opportunities for our students. For our students who come to us speaking a language other than English, our EL category students, um, there is a, a tremendous appetite in the Washoe County School District to look at expanding dual language programming. Um, we have two schools right now. We would love to see more. And so that's something that we will be looking at. We also very much want to look at expanding the availability for pre-K for those students and families who want to access that. We will actually be looking at um, creating a, a, a P3 leadership position because because we believe we need to create a P3 continuum. It's an investment in pre-K and investment in K so that when they get to third grade, they're where they need to be, but that has to be a continuum. It doesn't happen just because we wish it so. Again, I want to tell you as well that we understand that with increased funding uh, comes, a rightfully so, increased scrutiny. So we are using this as an opportunity to a deep, to to do a deep dive on where we can improve as a system. So we've just um, completed an external um, HR, uh, complete HR um, audit, if you will, of how we can improve our HR systems to better support our people. But we are also in the process of um, of contracting to do deep program analyses for our special education programs, our um, gifted and talented programs, our um, EL programs, and our alternative education programs. I want to make sure that as we have more money to spend in these areas, that we are actually investing them in the most research-based, highest impact way possible so that we see the results for our students. And so we hope to have those reports in place uh, hopefully by next fall, so that we can act on that into the next school year. In the at-risk category, um, we are looking at mentorship ops opportunities and obviously extended learning opportunities. Um, and again, it comes back to additional tutoring um, and time for our teachers to work with our students in small groups and other, which leads to additional staff, which I spoke about. Um, in special education, and again, a lot of this will um, come down to what it is that that program analysis yields for us in terms of where our biggest gaps are in our service delivery models and where we have things that are working that we want to amplify and um, spread across the board, so that will be continuing. And then finally, looking at our graduation rates, it is, uh, and you'll see in a minute as we're coming up to the end, we wanted to get through this quickly so you'd have ample time for your questions, plus I'm a fast talker. So we are looking at expanding our dual enrollment opportunities. We have a new partnership with the University of Nevada, Nevada Reno. Um, and we also, uh, next year, will be hiring for a position that will um, be a liaison between the district and the business community so that we can increase the um, industry certifications that our students can earn, but also internships. Our goal is that over time, every student in the Washoe County School District who wants an internship within our community can have one, and that's incredibly important for us. Again, with staffing, uh, it really comes down to what can we do to um, compensate our staff, but I also want to be clear, it's not just about state compensation. That's the biggest piece of the puzzle, but we have an important role to play as a system in how we review the ways in which our HR systems are structured to better support our um, our staff. So two things that we are taking on ourselves is that um, as of July, there will no longer be a 90-day waiting period for health care. Um, right now, when you are hired into the Washoe County School District, even the superintendent, um, you do not have health care for 90 days. And in a time when we are struggling to hire people, and especially in a time where if COVID taught us nothing, it taught us that health is paramount. And so um, we are taking on that cost to make sure that our staff has health care day one. We will also be eliminating one year only contracts for our teachers because we think that there are things in addition to the much needed compensation that we can do to attract and retain the highest quality personnel and signal to our staff that they matter to us and that we will invest in them. 
And so finally, I will leave you with this. And this is the promise that we have to our students, to our families, and to our community, that every student in the Washoe County School District is known by name, a name pronounced correctly with respect and affection, is known by strength, what they are good at, they all bring gifts to us, by need, and that they graduate prepared for whatever career, whatever path they choose for themselves. That is our job. And so with that, this is our contact information. You are more than, I think you know where to find us, but just in case, we thought we'd make it easy for you. Here is our contact information, and with that, we are happy to take your questions. Wow, thank you. Um, I know that I have a few questions, but I am going to let the other members start, and then if they don't ask it, we'll come back, but thank you so much for this presentation. Um, Speaker Yeager. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, um, Superintendent Enfield, President Smith, I see Trustee Rodriguez, and guests from Washington, I mean Washoe. Um, uh, They're the same acronym. No, it's, it's, it's been a long week, it's Friday evening, we certainly excuse that, but thank you so much for being here, and, and you know, I think for the vision that you laid out, this is, I think, exactly the reason we put this kind of um, presentation together, right, to, to talk about what the vision is and, and where we are and where we want to be and how we're going to get there collaboratively. Um, obviously, realizing you're at the start of the budgeting process, um, I have some questions, um, just more broader questions, but I think in my mind and hopefully in committee members' minds, this is the beginning of a, of a conversation that we'll continue to have on a regular basis to hear how things are going. And so I guess the first question I had was, we talked a lot about the COLAs, and of course those are important for educators. Um, but how in your mind, and I, realizing that, you know, there's a whole negotiation that has to happen over that, but, but how in your mind do you sort of uh, make those determinations about how much, how much you put to the COLA versus how much goes into direct programming? And if you can just kind of, not asking for specific numbers, but just you know, maybe the philosophy behind how you're gonna make what are tough decisions, because I'll readily admit this is a, a large injection of funding, but it doesn't get us to where the Commission on School Funding recommends. It's way more than we thought we would have this biennium, but we've got a ways to go. So how, how do you sort of analyze that decision-making process? Beth Smith, for the record. It is, it's a difficult process. Um, I will tell you, which is why I brought up that the Board of Trustees did include our signaling around the value of our staff, and we did include that in our legislative platform. Um, again, uh, this is not intended to be a commitment because we still do need to bargain with our groups, um, but we recognize uh, that our staff uh, deserves more than what they're earning right now, and um, many of us have discussed uh, the needs of upwards of 20%. Um, now, that's not to suggest we can get there in, in a single step, okay? So this is a pathway. But as uh, Dr. Enfield mentioned, it's not suitable that our first-year teachers are making $41,000 a year this year, and even with a 15% COLA, it would not quite get them to 50000 So I will say that this is something we've considered carefully, uh, but we are going to take a people first approach to this funding. Um, although we recognize that where we want to be eventually is maybe not where we're gonna be able to be in this very first step. Speaker Yeager, I would add, Susan Enfield for the record, I would add to that, and, and uh, Trustee Rodriguez is here, um, also representing the rest of our trustees, but we made it very clear in our legislative platform that this had to be priority one. I am, and I think I said this at the start, but I will say it again, I am gravely concerned about my ability to staff my district moving forward unless we don't make a serious investment. And, and I will say to, um, to reiterate what President Smith just said, that um, this is the beginning of catch up. Even if we get to 15 or 20, we won't be where we need to be. It's, a, it's the beginning of an ongoing investment to bring our educators and our education system here in the state of Nevada up to what our children really need for us to do. So it is priority one because um, we just, we won't be able to get the people. I mean, I, I have to say that, you know, a starting teacher in, in Washoe makes 41000 A starting teacher in my former district made $65,000. That's, that's almost what some of my principals start at. There's a desperate need to do this. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Could I ask uh, just a couple follow-ups on that? Um, appreciate those comments. Um, I had a question on, it was uh, slide 16, which was your potential use of state funding. Um, 
and it's it's the small writing on the bottom, but it you talked a little bit about this. It says the district is currently conducting assessments to strengthen programming for SPED, EL, GATE, and other and alternative education. I just wondered if you could talk about what are those assessments that you're referencing in there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and those are what I talked about before about how if we're going to have new money, we need to make sure this is a great opportunity to look at what we're doing, what's working, what isn't working. So we're right now um, talking with um, different uh, organizations and like going to issue an RFP for people to come in and do these program reviews for us. Um, they'll take several weeks and they'll come back to us with recommendations. Here's where you have gaps in your programming. Here are best practices from other places that you might want to consider. And so that will give us recommendations that will allow us, um, when we come back, to share the tremendous progress that we've made, um, You know how we can do that. Great, thank you. And one last question, if I could, Madam Chair, just um, sort of going off that last uh, comment you made, I mean, in your mind, how, how will you judge whether these programs were effective or not? What does that look like for you? Uh, maybe, maybe not in six months when we talk, but if we're back here in two years and uh, those of us here are fortunate to be back in these seats, uh, what does that look like for you in terms of being successful in the next couple of years? Thank you, Speaker Yeager. Susan Enfield, for the record. Um, that's, it's, I don't think I have a very satisfying answer for you on that, because I know that you would like to see those results quicker than we'll be able to show you. Um, I think us having a solid growth measure will be helpful, because that will give you a much fuller, more accurate picture of the progress our students are making, not just one end of your test score. That will be helpful. But I will tell you that one of the mistakes we make in public education is we don't stick with something long enough to, to let it yield. Now, I also want to be clear. I've also made the mistake of sticking with something too long when it didn't work. And so we're going to have to you know, do some checkpoints annually to see is this working. Talking with our staff, that's one of the biggest things we can get. Do you feel that this program, these resources are getting us, but ultimately it's going to be in the outcomes that we see in our students. Thank you. Assemblywoman Hadegi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and you're right. I was doing the math on the 15% and the 10% to see where it would get them. And it's, yeah, it's still under that $50,000. But I appreciate the presentation that you provided us. And I loved seeing that you've already given thought that the majority of the money should go into making sure that teachers are you know, earning a livable wage and that you're district is fully staffed up. Um, assuming you well, you go with the 15% and you have $6 million left, I was, I was um, curious about slide 17, 18, and 19, where you're going over the potential uses of the remaining state funding. Um, $6 million isn't a lot of money left over. And so I was just curious as to how you guys are going to prioritize, because I mean, this is three slides of potential uses of this funding, and they're all great needs. And so have you given thought to how you would prioritize these needs as a district? And because $6 million isn't going to get very far with some of these. Thank you for the question, Susan Enfield, for the record. So it would be premature for me to prioritize these right now because, again, that's not for me to do alone. Um, I will work with my team. We will work with our with our community to identify and come up with a proposal to bring forward to the board that we feel will be the greatest uh, return on investment of those resources. But I can tell you, I believe that it will be a mix of um, more learning time for our students, I think the general categories, more learning time, whether that's after school tutoring, um, extended summer school, all of that, and additional people in the building supporting them, be that um, social workers, counselors, what have you. And Beth Smith, for the record, I'd like to add that we also have the gift of doing our strategic plan right now as well. And so that has a lot of community engagement. And so our families and our community members and our students will be telling us what it is that they need and where they'd like our district to grow to. And so our board of trustees will be looking to that feedback as we make these decisions. Thank you. Assemblywoman Gorlick. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. I had a quick question about the district-sponsored charters. Can you tell me a little bit about what your relationship is with them and what their performance is? Thank you very much, we, uh, Susan Enfield, for the record. Uh, we actually just did our annual approval of our district-sponsored charters, and all were approved. Uh, we are, my deputy, Dr. Uh, Keo, and I have actually scheduled a meeting this spring with all of our district-sponsored charters to talk about uh, what is working in terms of their relationship with the district and areas where we need to improve. When I hear from one of our um, district-sponsored charter principals or staff members, as I did recently, pointing out an area of concern, we get back to 
to them right away, but I can tell you that my personal and professional philosophy when it comes to this is that we need to provide as broad a menu for our children as possible, and that it is not for me to make a choice for a family on what is best for their child. You know what is best for your child better than I, but it is my job to make sure that your public school is a viable option. Should you choose something else, that's fine. And so we want to really make this, you know, these are all of our children, so how can we make this a menu of options, not a zero-sum game? Thank you, Beth Smith, for the record. I'd just like to add that I would describe the relationship as warm and collaborative. Um, for example, our Board of Trustees recently approved an additional Coral Academy of Sciences Elementary School. Uh, so we recognize and support that school choice comes in many different forms, and we offer that within the district with our district-sponsored charters. Thank you, I appreciate that answer. And just out of curiosity, how many do you have? I want, I say, well, Susan Enfield for the record, I want to say roughly a dozen, I think. Thank you. Chair Dondura Loop. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being here this evening. As you well know, I have family in your district, so I'm acutely aware of some of the things um, that are going on. And so, um, just as a plug for Monday, um, I'm very excited about your extended learning opportunities and stay tuned because we'll be talking summer school. So um, I know in my family, believe it or not, the little people were very excited for summer school. So um, it, as, I, as I like to say as a teacher, it allows an educator to interact with kids at a different level and build relationships that are so important. So, um, and, and give them that increased knowledge. So, um, thank you very much. Um, can you talk a little bit about the pre-K seats that might be um, used with your state funds of COLA, after COLA? Thank you, Susan Enfield, for the record. Uh, I'm glad to hear that they're excited about summer school. That warms the superintendent's heart. Um, so with respect to pre-K, we are just in the beginning stages of sort of looking at what our pre-K pre landscape is. So um, what are the seats that are currently available? What is our capacity to expand those? But also that we look at it, not just the pre-K that we can provide as a district, which will never be all-inclusive and meeting the needs of all of our children, but what are the local providers in the area that we can also partner with. So for example, when I talked about creating a P3 continuum, um, in my former district, we actually partnered with our local pre-K providers, whether it was a family friend and neighbor or, or a Head Start, and we would actually do trainings on Saturdays because they can't shut down <laughs> um, in the middle of the week, and we would do trainings so that they knew how we were preparing students and what our incoming kindergartners needed to know. So we want to look at building out models that are inclusive of our local providers and really, once we get this person in place, really assess how many, how many seats we have and how many we actually think we can provide with quality. So I'll get back to you with more details. Okay. More. I'll look forward to hearing how many seats you think you can um, wrangle. So thank you. And Madam Chair, may I go on just a little bit? Um, so I noticed under the SPED category, you put in expand social, emotional, mental, and behavioral supports. I... I sort of struggled at first because I was like, well, maybe it goes under the at-risk category or, you know, I was really plugging it in in several places. And so can you talk a little bit about um, what you're doing with that support with staff and how you're, because we know staff needs help, mm -hmm. right? Our kids are desperate mm -hmm. and we know that, um, but we also have staff that are dealing with them and they need help too. And so can you just talk a little bit about the, um, that whole piece, how that puzzle, how it fits together, how you partner with the teachers, the parents and the students. Yeah, thank you. So Susan Enfield for the record. So there's, um, there's lots to that. Uh, and, and you are right that the need for social, emotional, mental health supports goes across every category of child and goes for our adults as well. So um, I think, though, it is fair to say that while we know that, that 
um, many children experienced some setbacks uh, during the pandemic. We know that especially for our students um, with more profound special needs, their time away from school was so detrimental. Uh, so detrimental. Um, and so we need to do what we can to, you know, get them back to where they were before they left. I will tell you that the biggest challenge right now is just getting the staff. It's not even supporting the staff. It is getting the staff. So we are actually having to start looking at, are there, um, are there additional compensation models we need to be looking at when it comes to special education staff? Because right now we simply don't have the, the, the number of bodies that we need um, to meet the needs of our children. And so it all comes back to that compensation model. How can we make this a more attractive space? And I will say too, it's not just the actual salary that you are making, but um, the notion that um, if I'm in a if I'm in a self-contained classroom with a group of high need students and I'm the teacher and I have three aides, but the district can only hire one or two of those aides, that's where we hear those hor horrible stories, right? Where somebody gets hurt, where people they they're just done, they just can't take it anymore. And so it really comes back to our ability to staff these programs. And so I will tell you that. Um, Again, while the compensation pay piece is huge, I think looking at are there modifications that we can make to our special education service delivery models, and I think there are. Um, we also have provided very strong dedicated leadership for our special education programs, which we didn't have prior, which will help. We are also forming a superintendent special education family advisory council so that I can meet regularly with our families of children with special needs to find out what their experience is so that we can improve that. But overall, what is it? what are the things that we can do do outside of compensation as a district to make this a place where people feel valued and safe and successful in coming to work. Thank you so much for uh, for addressing that. I I always said, you know, when you have happy teachers and happy kids or happy students, uh, you get the love of learning and then you get happy schools, right? And so um, it, it seems so silly, but um, you really have to have those all those things to um, help with the burnout that our teachers are facing, the large class sizes, um, the behavior issues, right? The increased requirements from teachers. Um, so thank you so much for addressing that. And, um, and you may be answering this later. I don't wanna take a lot of time, but um, just tell me how you know, we're assisting teachers with all of that so that we can keep them here and we can keep the kids learning and loving school. Thank you, Susan Enfield, for the record. Well, as I said, um, it really comes down to our ability to staff. That's the best way that we're going to provide them with the support and the classroom environment that our children need and deserve. And that's a challenge for us right now. It just is. Um, so we are looking at, are there other things that we can do? Are there um, creative models that some of our schools are using to create teams and, and pods for collaboration where they can have teachers helping other teachers? But I can tell you right now that um, our teachers are exhausted. They're, and it's not just because it's March. Every teacher is exhausted in March, even under the best of circumstances I know as a former teacher. Um, but they're, they're beyond, ex you know, they were March exhausted in October. So um, we're, we're, as I said, we're keenly aware. So that's why we are going to be surveying our staff to see sort of what their biggest needs and wishes are when it comes to their own well-being. And then, as I said, we have some external professionals coming in to help do some trainings so that we can equip them with some tools to um, deal Deal with the impact of what is a very, very high stress job. You know, we think our jobs are high stress. I would argue that our, you know, all of our teachers, but it, our teachers um, who teach some of our children with special needs, that's one of the hardest jobs there is. So how can we equip them with some tools? Um, and also I will say this, um, it, 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 it's, it's a softer part of the support, but um, we have to celebrate them. We have to, and you can do two things at once. You can acknowledge the hard reality that we are facing right now and the difficulties they are facing in the classroom and still celebrate the extraordinary dedication that, that these folks show every day. And I will say it again, we will come back to you at any time with all of the data that you want, but what you really need to do is be in our schools. And you need to see for yourselves what these amazing people are doing every day with our children. Because as you said, it's magic. 
Um, and so we have to celebrate that and tell the good stories because when all they hear are the negative stories, that doesn't help. Yes, it's it's very easy to find all the things wrong and never remember the things right. And and um, but there is nothing like standing in front of um, I guess I loved teaching and standing in front of a set of kids and seeing them their successes every day is amazing. And when I think of my kids and some of them wander the halls here, um, I what I think of is you I've forgotten all the silly things that happened, you know, and uh, teaching is an amazing profession and I hope that we can encourage more young people to go into that. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblywoman Brown May. You good? Assemblyman Miller. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all. Um, I, I want to say um, thank you for your thoughtful, kind, and caring leadership of the district. Um, I appreciate um, how much you all have um, clearly thought. You were very thoughtful in what you're doing, what you're planning to do um, as you addressed your mental health um, things. I, I know that you mentioned, um, if I remember correctly, that with what you've done with mental health, that was a part ESSER and then some additional funding. So if you don't have the numbers now, I would like to know kind of what that whole picture looks like from a financial perspective for you all. Um, additionally, um, I would like to also know, you mentioned about declining enrollment. Mm -hmm. And so if you could address um, the declining enrollment piece, that would be real helpful. Thank you. Do you want to start? Um, uh, Beth Smith, for the record, I will have Dr. Enfield uh, talk about the specific numbers around mental wellness. But for declining enrollment, um, it really has to do with birth rates. Um, years ago, it was roughly on average uh, half a child for every door that we had in Washoe County. I believe that number is just over 0.3. And so we can actually see based on the enrollment from kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade, and we know that we're in the middle of a bubble right now that we've known for a very long time, that there was a very high group of kindergartners that came in roughly uh, 10 years ago, and as they start to graduate out, those numbers are also coming down. And we also look at housing affordability, quite honestly, um, for the ability to have a young family come and buy a home in Washoe County where the average house price is $500,000 and rent for a one-bedroom apartment is around $1,800, it's extremely difficult. Um, so we do believe that it's a mix of factors, um, but the current bubble that we're in with the graduating groups is something that we have anticipated for some time. Thank you, Susan Enfield, for the record. I think I would add to what President Smith said that um, uh, we also saw, particularly during the pandemic, parents and families making choices based on the reality that they were living. And I think especially with our youngest learners, where we've seen some of the biggest drops, and it's not just locally, it's nationally, is within the kindergarten years. Because um, parents and families are making the decision that they're going to keep their children home. And I think some of that is carried over. So I think there's lots of different reasons why we're seeing that declining enrollment. With respect to um, the investments in mental health, I believe we are all pulling that information together to share with you. And so that'll be forthcoming. Thank you. And then I just have one last question. Um, you mentioned that the um, that with the new definition of the at-risk population, it will go from five thousand I mean, from eighteen thousand to five thousand. But you stated that you still needed that support for the eighteen for the remaining. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious to understand. I know it was previously free and reduced lunch that was the qualifier. So what is it that you all have? Um, what metrics are you all using that indicates that those folks still need the at-risk um, funding and how they maybe are missed? I'm just curious to know. Uh, Beth Smith, for the record, I'll start, and then I'm going to have Dr. Enfield be my anchor. So both formulas are not of our own choosing. Uh, they're actually set by the state 
So the current, if we were really looking at free and reduced lunch, which by the way, used to and is in many states, the metric, that would be much higher than 18,000. It's the current formula from the state where we have 18,000 students that qualify at the moment. Under the new proposed formula, only 5,000 students would actually qualify. So that leaves a delta of 13,000 students that on one day qualify as at-risk students. And then once the new formula goes into effect, they don't. And we have to recognize that those students still absolutely need that same support, but the district would have previously received that additional weighted funding, again, just one day earlier, but then once the new formula goes into effect, they don't. And so that will create um, a reduction in the services that we can provide and what needs to pull from the general fund in order to meet those needs. And I'd like to invite Dr. Enfield to add more. Thank you. Susan Enfield, for the record. I think the other thing I would add on to that, you, that is absolutely correct, but also another challenge for us is the way the weights work for our students. So a student um, who would qualify for multiple weights, we only get the funding for the highest amount weight they would receive. So for example, if I am a... Um, a student who has arrived speaking no English, and I'm from a low-income household, we're not going to receive the weighted funding for both of those characteristics, even though I need the funding for both of those characteristics. We're only going to get one. And so when we talk about the whole child, the way that we are looking at weights is a bit challenging as well. And so, I'm sorry, less, so, but they would get the higher funding. The but not total funding. funding for all of the needs that okay. they would have. Okay, so then my next question is, how do you, um, if you still identify within your district that those students are gonna need the help, have you thought through um, what you're going to do, how you're going to um, handle that? Beth Smith for the record, and this will also go back to the weighted funding. So going back to our example of a student who comes to us not speaking English and needs those English language supports, but they may also be gifted and talented, and they only receive one of those fundings. The district is still required and federally mandated to provide those supports. That's where we have to draw down on our general fund. So we will still meet those needs, but the funding in order to do that comes out of our general fund, and that's what we do right now. So again, in the example of a student who is uh, an English language learning student, and they may also come from an at-risk situation. The district still provides all of those services today. It just comes out of our general fund allotment because we're not receiving the full weighting of both of those categories from the state. So we still do provide those services. We just have to pull from our general fund allotment in order to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Assemblywoman Bacchus. Thank you, Madam Chair, and mine may just may be a statement. I don't know if it's going to um, need a response, but I thank you both for your presentation. But I, we, I will tell you, we've heard a lot of presentations this session about at risk um, and what that's going to look like with respect to free and reduced lunch versus the metrics provided by Infinite Campus looking at graduation rates. It's been a struggle. I mean, but on the other side, I just want to make sure you guys recognize that the weighted formula um, is like it went from, I think, um, in the last biennium, biennium for at-risk students of 0 0.03, which yielded like, I think, less than $250 a student. And at-risk is, and looking at the free and reduced lunch, we have a lot of issues with community schools. Um, and then today, I'm not sure if you guys had the opportunity to hear um, our K through 12 subcommittee, but that weight was recommended to look at it being a 0 0.35. I mean, whether that's gonna end up at the end of the session or not, um, but that was what we were looking at. And so it's a huge difference. And I, I know my colleagues and myself, we really are hoping those larger dollars go to those schools and that you guys rest assured that at-risk students are being addressed. Thank you for that. Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I have a different question, even though I kind of want to follow up on the um, ELL funding, because um, it's currently my brain. When I was listening to you guys do the explanation, I was trying to figure out in your Latino population, which is your highest number, how many of them are actually ELL? Thank you, Susan Enfield, for the record. That's a very good question, and I want to. I, I'm not even going to say the percentage I think it is because then I'll be wrong on the record. May I get back to you with that? 
Sure. Let me make sure I get the right percentage. Okay. And so my next question is on, it was on slide, um, I believe it's 13. I, I wanted to know more about, um, do you have the data that shows the gains that you made from the uh, comprehensive tutoring that you engaged in? Susan Enfield, for the record, we're beginning to compile that, but we um, it's only been a year or two, so we don't have great data, but our research and evaluation team is beginning to pull that together, so we should have that shortly. So, and then, thank you for that. So my follow-up question to that is, and it might be the same answer because it was kind of similar, you also listed the targeted instructional support and intervention for uh, your multilingual students, and I wanted to see what was the data, the beginning point and the end point, right? Because for me, I'm super always interested in how did the money perform for the mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. We can provide that for you. And then one final question, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, so this morning when we were having our um, finance meeting on K-12, um, NDE was talking about that there is, um, I don't know if it's prior training or current training or future training um, for infinite campus in order to pull the grad data, right, in order to uh, get information that will help to drive interventions, right? So if you know how your students are performing in the middle or in the end, that how the infinite campus data can be pulled in order to understand what you have going on in your schools. Do you actually, how many people do you actually have trained on the infinite campus in order to pull that kind of grad data or what they called, uh, in addition to that ground truth data? Uh, Susan Enfield, for the record, I would have to find that out for you. I have not been a part of that conversation, but I'll talk with my team when I get back and get you those numbers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Gansert. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Enfield and Chair Smith, for being here today and representing Washoe County. Um, I appreciate the value that you're placing on our professionals and all the work that you're doing to raise their pay and also to provide the supports that they need. Um, I had a couple of questions. So one is around special ed. So you've got charters that are sponsored through your school district and we've got the state charters too. And sometimes the charter schools don't get equivalent funding for the special ed for the SPED. And so in your school district, do you fund them at the same rate, like dollars per student, as, as uh, your regular public schools? Thank you. That's a question, Susan Enfield, for the record, that we discussed earlier, and we're actually looking, because we've had some questions around how various um, funding sources are going to our district-sponsored charter schools, and that's a conversation my deputy and I are having tomorrow. So I'm not looking just at SPED, but at other title programs as well. Okay, thank you mm -hmm. for that. And then um, I wanted to follow up on Assemblywoman Backus, her conversation. So we did change, the formula changed the number of at-risk students, but as she mentioned, the weight went from 0.03 to 0.30, so 10 times, and we might end up going to 0.35. And also, if you look at the total pool of funds, we had $60 million in the bucket, and now it's $163 million. So um, the, I pulled it up from today. So instead of having $244 per student, you're going to have 2570 eight or more dollars per student. So I think sometimes you've got to look at like the total amount that you're getting because you're definitely getting plussed up on that front. Um, and then, you know, last again, when I first met with Dr. Enfield, she said one thing to me that stuck, and I probably won't say it exactly right because I can't remember the term that you use for students, but, you know, we tend to move really slowly in education. We want our students to learn in like a year or two for a child in an underperforming school or where the class is, is, its size is too big or they're understaffed. Is, it's a huge, huge deal. And you said that you move, move at the speed of the kids. So you recognize the need to change now and not go through processes for years and years and years to try to change the outcomes. And that's what I see you doing today. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you, Senator, and uh, it's uh, Susan Enfield for the record. I get criticized for going too fast, and my answer is um, I'm only going as fast as our children need me to go, which means I'm never going fast enough. Thank you, members. Any other questions? Okay, I had a few, and a lot of them were asked by our members, but 
as, honestly, you know, in, in 2021, we implemented the new funding formula that went into effect. And in that legislative session, we were able to put funding into education that was an unprecedented amount in that session. And then we came to 2023, and it's the first time I've been in this building that we actually had money, right? And not just money, but money that we could put into education at historical numbers for the state of Nevada. While it may not be the ultimate amount of money we would like to put in, but we have this small pie that we have to cut up for all the, the needs, the, so many of the unmet needs that we've had um, in the state for so long. But I want to commend you at what you did looking at your presentation. When you go to the ESSER dollars on your strategic um, page for ESSER, there was class size, and you, you mentioned it, but can you tell me what you did to help with the class size reductions, um, how you assisted the teachers when their, their classes went over those mm. caps? Do you want to speak to that? Uh, Susan Enfield, for the record, thank you. So uh, we actually used some of those dollars to hire additional staff to bring class sizes down. But I believe that uh, President Smith mentioned earlier, we also worked with our associations to provide additional compensation for staff when their class size went above a certain number. Um, this was something that I was familiar with. We did it in my prior district. So your class size is capped at something. If you go over that, you should be compensated for that. Now, that does doesn't make it easier, but it's an acknowledgement that we understand that your workload has increased because you have more little people or big people <laughs> running around your room um, than you did before. So we're looking at ways um, that we can acknowledge and compensate our staff while at the same time trying to bring class size down. And I will say that um, our WEA partners and our trustees and I feel strongly that class size reduction is also <coughs> one of our top priorities. And Beth Smith, for the record, I'll also add that in addition to teachers, we also did this for caseloads for our counselors who are also dealing with unprecedented demands. Thank you. And then the next page on the educator supports, you had mentioned substitute incentives or you helped the substitutes. Could you go a little bit more into what you did there? Yes, we, um, thank you, Susan Enfield, for the record. We actually increased substitute pay to be more competitive. Uh, our substitute pay was just too low, and when a substitute can choose to drive 20 minutes away and make more, that was a problem. So we increased our substitute pay. And Beth Smith, for the record, I'll also add that before we did the increase in pay, we started with uh, bonuses for our substitutes based on the number of days that they were working in the district. So we first started with a bonus program that recognized the number of days that they were working, and then we took the second step of actually raising their pay. Impressive. Um, so... I know it's early, you're in the planning for the upcoming budget, but again, as, as I said, this year we're able to put historic numbers and I hope that every legislative body that follows us is able to do the same. But I look forward to being in this seat in two years to hear what you've done with those dollars because I'm extremely impressed as a legislator after we sat through over the weekend and, and all the subcommittee meetings we've had. Um, to hear the struggles, and you guys have really thought outside the box, um, pinching every penny, but to put that money in the schools and the areas around the schools to support your educators, your staff, but more important, our kiddos in the class. So I just wanted to tell you thank you for that, and I look forward to, in two years, um, what you bring back to us. Madam Chair, may I just say that we look forward in two years as well. Uh, it will be um, the end of a chapter that is part of an ongoing story. So what we will have to tell you in two years will be, I think, incredibly positive, but we'll still have work to do, and we'll have a plan to do it. Thank you. Before I close out, members, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I will thank you so much for the presentation. With that, we will close the presentation for Washoe County. And we're actually moving faster today than we did on Saturday. How's that at all possible? 
<laughs> so, <laughs> moving on to our, our final school district of the night, we have Clark County School District. Good evening. You know what? Can we, before you start, can we take just a 10 minute potty break? Oh, five minutes? Okay, five minute recess. <laughs>
Thank you all for your patience. Um, we will call the meeting back to order and welcome CCSD. You can get started whenever you like. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you for having us um, and the joint legislative hearing this evening. Before I get started, I'd like to introduce the, uh, my phenomenal team that I have here. I do have my um, board president, uh, Trustee Garcia Morales, who's to my left, my chief finance officer, Mr. Jason Gowdy, who also sits on the funding commission as well, my deputy superintendent um, of instruction, teaching and learning, and I do have a team from that is in Vegas as well, ready to answer questions. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity, and I will turn it over to my board president for some welcome remarks. Thank you, Dr. Jara. For the record, my name is Evelyn Garcia Morales. I serve as a school board president for Clark County School District. This week, the school board and the superintendent hosted three community conversations where we collected feedback from parents and community members who were excited about really envisioning the future of our district. Many participants envisioned manageable class sizes and much needed wraparound services like mental health support. One community member um, in particular who attended one of our meetings this week uh, was a graduate of our school district many moons ago. He said that the school district opened the doors for him to access the American dream. He is a business owner and has 36 employees in our community. Another participant shared that they moved to Las Vegas about three years ago. They had no children, however, wanted to be there to support our school district. And consistently at each meeting, students and parents um, have asked for manageable classroom sizes. Um, excuse me, I already said that. <laughs> we heard loud and clear that is more uh, that there is uh, there are more needs than funding allocated from the state. Our parents are still asking us, really in frustration, what happened to the marijuana money. And what we've learned um, that we must continue to inform and educate our families on the new funding formula. Thank you for inviting us here today as we continue addressing the decades of underfunding and education from our state. And what is proposed now as a historic investment, but our children are really depending on us for funding to support our academic success. Our community conversations are part of the equation. Next Wednesday, at our work session, our board will be discussing our community's priorities that have taken place during the community conversations and will inform the goals for the 23-24 um, school year, fiscal year. And finally, as part of our commitment to our community's priorities, um, they will also inform the district's future budget, depending, of course, on historic investment from the state. Um, I do want to share, and I will remind the, um, the body uh, at the end of this meeting, we have one more community meeting happening tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, so it's an open invitation. We certainly hope uh, if you are in town to have you present. Dr. Jara. Thank you, Madam President, um, Chairwoman. Um, thank you again. I'd I, I like to go back to, um, to the start of this um, presentation and, and really share my gratitude um, for having us come here. Um, after listening to my colleagues last Saturday, in and out, in between meetings and different things um, that were going on our last Saturday, and also um, the State Charter Authority and um, Superintendent Enfield kind of warmed it all up for everybody, uh, for us. I feel like this is, for me, it's like I'm back into the classroom like that last period after lunch. Uh, when kids are coming in after they've had a, a phenomenal uh, presentation by my colleague, uh, Dr. Enfield. But I, 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 in the five years that I've been in the Clark County School District, I, I really want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart because this is the first time that I've been invited um, to share um, the great work that's been ongoing in the Clark County School District in spite of what you hear. Um, so really hearing from us directly is, um, is, is welcome. So there's a lot of presentations, there's a lot of data, but I just, um, I think it's important because there's, as, as Dr. Enfield and my colleagues across the entire state said, there's hardworking educators that come to school every single day. Classroom teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria, support staff, administrators, central office, 40,000 employees in the Clark County School District that have devoted their life. And, and we all know, I know that uh, there's a level of frustration from all of us um, because we could be doing better. And, and I think 
we, in some cases, in a lot of cases, as a school district, we are improving, but it's just, does, you can't see it just yet. We've, but it, it, it's, and I know you're in tough seats as well, um, and, and the chairwoman mentioned the historic funding that's coming, and we all know and the speaker as well, and others have mentioned it's not enough, but it's, it's the best. Um, and, and, and so thank you. And we are, um, I'll tell you that in accountability has been a big topic. It has been a big topic for my board, for me. I am accountable for every penny that we get, um, whether it's X dollars or not. And we're gonna stretch it and do what we can because there's 300,000 lives that come to work, to school, every single day. And um, as wanted to kind of give you a picture of some of the things, obviously I got a seven member board and we've kind of divided and broken up the district. Shouldn't have said broken up because it's not really popular, but we've divided the district into three different regions um, because it's, 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 it's a little bit of us managing and, and addressing the needs of our entire communities into three regions by region superintendent. And then we have school associates and we have divided our entire district but here's where we are, our student diversity. And, and I, I, wanna, I wanna start by, when I talk about our children, I, I wanna tell you that uh, the challenges that we're facing every single day, 74, almost 75% of our children are economically disadvantaged. We have 16% that are English language learners, 12.4% that are special education, receive special education services. We have children that speak 93 different languages and 100, from 140 countries. 17% of our kids, our families are undocumented. We just opened up this year a service in the Family Support Center and have our first ever um, division to really provide services because they are Americans, they are here and we're gonna educate them, and we're providing services for families that are undocumented. And 3.6% of our students are experiencing homelessness. And I say all of this because it is a beautiful tapestry of children that we serve every single day. And we don't make any excuses, and we support them. Um, 304,000 students, 42 magnet schools. We have the most robust magnet program. We have Southeast Technical Academy that is recognized nationally as the number one magnet school in the nation. We have outstanding magnet programs and really excited about how we expand and continue to expand our choice options. Federal relief funds. Um, I want you to know that when we started and received our dollars um, for our, I'll start with our ARP, which is the $777 million that we receive that we have until September of 2024 to spend. Uh, learning acceleration, interventions to address disproportional impact to diverse stu students. We have about 49% of that money spent. I wanna say that uh, we've been careful, we've been monitoring, we've been making amendments to that spend. Um, if you spend it all at once, Right? I think that's wasteful spending. And if you spend it all at the end, that means you just need to spend to spend. So we have been strategic in how we do that. Our CARES are too. Our ESSER dollars, are, we still have till September of 2023 to spend. And this is the money that came from the federal government that was um, to reopen our schools and accelerate the learning. And we are to date 85.7 of that money spent. Um, and the CARES Act one, that is, um, that was at the beginning of the COVID pandemic and we spent 99.2% of that money. So I want you to know that we have been good stewards of the taxpayer money. Where has the money gone on the, on the ESSER spend on ARP of the 777 million? 616 million went to student support and student success. We've upgraded our technology. Our tier one, we've heard a lot about tier one instructional materials. That is what we use um, and we've adopted curriculum. When I got to the Clark County School District five years ago, what I heard in my listening tour is that our, our principals and our staff and our teachers didn't have materials. Um, they hadn't been able to purchase instructional materials for over 10 years. So our teachers, 
were teaching with resources that they were buying on teacher pay teacher and not aligned to the standards. So we have been able to use federal dollars to be able to do that. Um, so our teachers have resources that are aligned in math and science. Uh, the Department of Education just adopted our ELA curriculum. So we're looking and looking forward to making that purchase. So our educators, when, 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 when you hear from my colleagues that our teachers are tired, our teachers are tired um, because of all the challenges that we're coming, com teaching is complex. And what our educators do every single day, um, plus all this professional development that we've added um, to support them, to make sure that they provide instruction to our kids, um, has been critical. We've also purchased supplemental materials, which is our tier two for kids that need intervention. We just also adopted social emotional learning curriculum using ESSER dollars. Summer learning program, community partnerships. We put out a partnership for our community so our community can provide services for our kids. We provided, um, and, and I know Senator Neal, because we, we, we provided to Nevada Partners, $2 million. We provided to the girls on the run. We've provided to a lot of our community partners to do after school weekend using our ESSER dollars as well. So it's not just the Clark County School District, it's not just the 40,000 employees, it's all of our partners. Mental health services, also very important. Direct allocations for our elementary schools, because our budgets in our elementary schools are a little bit um, not as robust as our secondary schools. $23 million went to a direct allocation for our elementary schools. Online curriculum and instruction, tutoring, services, ELL endorsement for our teachers. Crisis response team, what does that mean? That is providing a resource for our response team that is providing a service when, when we have crisis in our schools. We had to provide services because of the number, and I'll give you some facts. Um, in, in March 1, 2020, in the first year COVID year, our crisis response team responded to 958 crises in the Clark County School District. In 21-22, 1,474. And this year to date, over a thousand crises that our crisis response. So what we did is we allocated resources to provide support to our crisis team. Teachers and principals and staff, that's what we provided um, and did an incentive recruitment and retention bonus for our support staff, our principals our, and, and our educators. Professional learning, $36 million in continuing professional learning. Dr. Enfield talked about the science of reading. We've also invested in the science of reading, the educator pipeline, our support staff going to UNLV to become, uh, to become teachers. Um, our strategic planning, our ESSER and accountability. I want you to know that we take this very serious and we are continuing to monitor our implementation and we do this on a quarterly basis and then we make adjustments as we go. Here is where we are in our spend. So we calculated it out till September of 2020, so we're ahead of schedule. Uh, we also just received commendations from NDE on our spend and actually reported of our ESSER plan and our accountability last, I think it was two weeks ago at the, in Washington at the Council of the Great City Schools with 78 urban superintendents as a model in accountability and implementation of our ESSER spend. One of the things that I'm very proud is that when we selected our priorities, this is something that we were not to the community. 13,000 responses, we had community. I turned this over to, um, what I did is I turned it over to uh, partners and I said, go find out and tell me what our community needs and where we spend our money. They came back and then we compiled it all together board approved it, aligned to the strategic plan, and sent it over to the Department of Education. So here's my, one of my biggest concerns. What happens when the money runs out? So when you have technology one-to-one, -one, that means Chromebooks. That means, I, hate, I don't want to say smart boards because that ages myself, but it's those projectors, those interactive flat panels that we're buying. What do we do with those? Um, how do we continue to um, upgrade them? Our, our curriculum, $99 million in science curriculum as a district, 
60 million in mathematics, 48 million in social studies, professional learning, the science of reading, as I talked about, our tier two instructional materials, $25 million, our community partners and tutoring, our summer learning, and this is part of the work that my uh, board president talked a little bit about when you're going out into the community. Now, what we're doing this week, continuing tomorrow, they're helping me because it's not me, it's not the superintendent by himself, it's the community, it's the team. How do we prioritize? What do we keep? Do we want to continue with Chromebooks or do we want to have curriculum or do we put more money in for educators, right? Because now when this goes away on the one-time spend from the federal government, now we have to then own it in our, in our state general budget. When you look at our mental health, um, Assemblyman Miller, um, 77 million. We, we, it, if you recall back to our COVID response and we were experiencing the isolation and I like to say that not only we were dealing with a health, mental health, we were dealing with a health crisis, an academic crisis, but also a mental health crisis that we have no idea how deep the scars are for our children and for our staff. So immediately, I, I, and, I, and I'll tell you, I believe it was after the 12th suicide when a ninth, nine year old committed suicide, I said to the team, we can't have this. What do we do? We, create, we, we put in every single school a multi-leadership team. Every school, and we were still in distance education. Our staff came in because of the crisis, the mental health crisis that we were dealing with in October of 2020. I say that because we acted with urgency and worked with our union partners to say, what do we need to do because we need our children in our school. I am proud when we opened up our schools that five bargaining units that I work with were behind us to say, we need our schools open. So we created a multi-leadership team to look at data, look at attendance, look at, look at the grades. Then we bought and purchased Panorama, which was a universal screener for our kids, the ability to say, I need help. And then our staff would make contact and support them. So we also um, looked at and partnered with Hazel Health for telehealth, not only for students, but also for staff. As Superintendent Enfield, we also have care solids. We call it a concierge program because then it's, it's a warm handoff from our educators to our families to help them and connect them to the resources. We work with the harbor, which is our county support. We have five harbors. Some are, are, are with the county. I, I believe, I think, it, I'm remembering, I believe that the legislature also funded some um, last session. And again, one of the things that I'm really proud of, the work in partnership and community, um, Nevada State College, soon to be university, um, we allocated ESSER dollars in a conversation that I had with President Pollard. I was in her office one of these days that um, we were just sitting, I was catching my breath one afternoon, sitting, meeting with her in her office, and I talked about the crisis that we were dealing with. And I said, and she says, well, how can I help you? I can help you and create a program. I just don't have the resources. So my board approved an MO, MOA with Nevada State College, and we're, we gave them a resource so they can start helping building because I need more psychologists. So, so it, it is all hands on deck in this community, and, and, and there's a lot of work that is going on in the Clark County School District. So the question then becomes, what happens after ESSER goes away? We need to prioritize the needs for our kids. I know that there was a lot of conversation on NAEP, and which is the nation's report card. When you look at the Clark County School District, and I'm gonna tell you, I am not satisfied with where we are. However, when you look at urban America, when you look at the TUDA, which is a partnership that we have with 25 other urban districts in the United States of America, the Clark County School Districts, performs same or higher than 92% of other large urban districts in the eighth grade reading. When you look at 72% of other large urban districts in fourth grade reading, 
in eighth grade math, 84%, and 72% in fourth grade math. Are we happy? Absolutely not. Are we satisfied? Absolutely not. When you look at the student demographics, when you look at there's some kids that we need higher intervention, and that creates that sense of urgency for all of us in this district. So I'll, I'll turn it over to my chief finance officer so he can go briefly and in through some of the funding. I got the slides. Good evening, uh, members of the Joint Committee. Jason Gowdy for the record, and I am the Chief Financial Officer for the Clark County School District. Uh, thank you for the time to provide some background information and budget scenarios today. Governor Lombardo's proposed budget provides a $2 billion investment in K-12 education over the biennium. Along with the money, key priorities include literacy, early childhood services, teacher pipeline, school safety, class size, and accountability. We appreciate the significant step towards adequate and optimal funding proposed for the pupil-centered funding plan. Additionally, the legislature has proposed an additional $250 million in funding through SB 231. I would like to just provide a high-level summary of the governor's proposed budget for the Clark County School District, as you see on the slide. I'm not going to go through each line, but wanted to provide the information and touch on some key numbers. The total increase in operating fund revenues in 2023-2024 over the 22-23 fiscal year is estimated at $397 million. The increase forecasted in the 24-25 year over the 23-24 year is approximately $126 million. The funding for weighted programs for English learners at risk, gifted and talented students also increased significantly. Total weighted funding in 23-24 is forecasted to increase over the 22-23 year by $184 million, and another $15 million increase in 24-25. Two key points on the weighted funding. First, this money must be spent on the specific options listed in NRS 387. And as noted in the slide, this funding is not part of the collective bargaining process per NRS 387.1217, subsection 7. Next slide. Next one, the one, there we go. Thank you. So this, this slide uh, summarizes the additional funding the, dis dis the district is forecasted to receive based off the governor's proposed budget and identifies specific expenditures that have already been made or will need to be made during the 23-24 fiscal year. As you can see, we mentioned that the total project projected increase in revenues is $397 million. Um, dollars. During the 23-22-23 school year, the district worked with our bargaining groups to increase pay for our employees utilizing one-time reserves in the 22-23 school year, which will need to be covered by the sustained revenues in the future. As you can see, we increased the starting pay of teachers, changed all principals to 12-month contracts, changed certain office staff to 12-month positions, reclassified transportation positions, which increased pay for our bus drivers and other transportation employees, and we also fulfilled our uh, prior commitment to our support professionals for step increase. These increases totaled approximately $44.4 million. Several operational uh, increases are either legally mandated as a result of factors outside our control or due to additional schools for our students. Due to the change in the PERS contribution rate, the district will incur approximately $32.4 million in additional PERS contributions. The district will add two schools, and additional funding for these schools is approximately $6.6 .6 million. Based off the significant increases in energy and natural gas prices, um, we are forecasting an increase of approximately $24.4 million in our utilities. There are some reductions in one-time costs that benefit the district in 23-24 as well of approximately $29 million, and the majority of this additional resource is the reduction in our Hold Harmless funding for previously um, designated Zoom, Victory, and SB 178 schools. So as you can see, after the reduction of known or forecasted increase in expenditures, CCSD has approximately $311.7 million in incremental funding for the 2324 to address our operational needs as well as needs through the bargaining process. Next slide. So here are a couple of scenarios um, with some of the most common pay and benefit increases uh, built in with some other components uh, for um, for, for you to review. 
So the first one, um, scenario one, is based off a 5% increase in pay, including benefits, and a 5% increase in Clark County School District's contribution to the employee's medical insurance plans. Scenario two is based off a 10% increase in pay, including benefits, and a 10% increase in the contribution to employees' medical insurance plans. Steps are essentially the standard movement on our pay, uh, pay schedules, and they range from a set dollar amount of $1,420 up to about a 5% increase in pay. Uh, to be clear, we have neither negotiated nor proposed these increases with our bargaining groups as they are just to provide context, um, as there's a lot of public, public discussions around 10% pay increases and available funding. Um, all the other assumptions in the scenario is the same in, in both scenario one and two. Uh, while we do have a $50 million placeholder for additional maintenance costs noted in this presentation, this will not meet any industry guidelines on required maintenance spend as our incremental funding needs to be at least 150 uh, million more than we have at this point. However, we need to start to increase our maintenance spend to ensure the facilities are operating well enough to keep our students in the classrooms all day, every day. <coughs> Consistent with the governor's and our priorities, we will be working with bargaining groups on increased accountability at all levels when we discuss increase in pay and benefits. The last component of the scenario is based off significant feedback from our classroom personnel, citing the great need for additional time for preparation and other tasks during the day without students in class. This is just an example of the types of additional options the district will be considering, and again, is only included to provide context as to the est estimated funding for an option of this type. As you can see, with a 5% increase in pay and medical insurance contributions, as well as the other spending options, there's approximately $48 million left to address other programs to impact student achievement. However, with a change to a 10% increase in pay and medical contributions, the district would end up in an $84 million deficit. Additionally, the district is forecasting an increase of $126 million in 24-25. And with similar increases required, there will not be sufficient funding to make up for any deficit created during the 23-24 school year. As a final comment on the slide, I wanted to anticipate questions on how SB 231 could provide CCSD's additional funding to fill these potential funding gaps. Uh, the district is always appreciative of, of additional funding to help meet the needs of our students, staff, and community. However, discussions of this one-time funding outside of the pupil-centered funding plan being, being utilized to pay for pay increases is a concern. To give some perspective for the Clark County School District, a 10% pay increase for our licensed personnel alone is approximately $150 million. If one-time funding outside the pupil-centered funding plan is utilized in the first year of the biennium to pay those increases, um, during the second year of the biennium, as I mentioned, we only get $126 million in incremental funding, and we would be at a deficit of $24 million to start before we had any other increases. So this would really put the, the, the district's uh, financial strength at significant risk. I thank you now, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Larson Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Gowdy. Members of the Joint Committee for the Record, Brenda Larson Mitchell. I serve as the Deputy Superintendent for the Clark County School District. I'm gonna share some snapshots of some of our student achievement data, but please know that live and center on ccsd.net is our data dashboard that we released last week, which we have um, transparent student achievement data for the district, for regions, and individual schools. This represents student achievement data in elementary school English language arts for students in grades three through five. The dotted horizontal line represents district proficiency in ELA in grades three through five prior to COVID-19 at about 50% proficiency. Essentially half of our students were non-proficient in ELA in grades three through five. The solid horizontal line represents district proficiency in ELA in grades three through five for the 21-22 school year. As a district, approximately 40% of our students in grades three through five are proficient in ELA. Please take a look at our student group proficiency levels. We have extreme proficiency gaps. 25% of our black African-American students are proficient 35% of our Hispanic students are proficient, and 18% of our English language learners 
and 15% of our students with disabilities are proficient. Here we do observe improvement for the district and all student groups in the results from the 2020-2021 school year to the 21-22 school year. While our students are rebounding, we have additional improvement to gain before we see a return to our 2018-2019 student outcome levels. Achievement gaps are still present as we look at the results across our student groups. Next slide, please. Middle school math. This represents student achievement in middle school mathematics for students in grades six through eight. In 2018-2019, 31% of our students were proficient in middle school mathematics. Based on 2021-2022 SBAC data, approximately 22% of our students in grades six through eight are proficient in mathematics. Let's take a moment to look at our student group proficiency levels in middle school math. Again, we have extreme proficiency gaps. 14% of our American Indian Alaska Native are proficient. 8% of our black African American students are proficient. 15.4% of our Hispanic students are proficient. 2% of our English language learners, and 5% of our students with disabilities are proficient. Students in grades six through grade eight did not rebound at the same rates as our elementary students, but we still observe improved rates across nearly all student groups. Next slide, please. This is grade 10 science proficiency rate measured by the criterion reference test. As a district in 2021, 2022, 19% of our students were proficient in science. Taking a moment to look at our student group proficiency levels in high school science, again, we have extreme proficiency gaps. 8% of our black African American students are proficient, 13% of our Hispanic students are proficient, and 2% of our English language learners and 5% of our students with disabilities are proficient. We also observe a decline in proficiency across all student groups. Next slide, please. So in 2016-17, approximately 50% of our students in third grade were proficient. We also need to take a look at our student achievement data over time. So out of those 50% of students in grade three in 2016-17 who were not proficient, 8.9 of them were at meets or exceed standards in grade eight. So we made movement with 8.9% of our students from grade three to grade eight. Next slide, please. Let's look at student proficiency levels over time in mathematics. Here we see that 1.4% of grade three students in 2016, 2017, who were not proficient in mathematics increased to at or above standards in grade eight during the 2021-22 school year. This data is a call to action. It becomes crystal clear that we need to impact student learning by making high impact decisions focusing on teaching and learning. We must focus on the right work to make an impact for every student. The most important place in the Clark County School District is the classroom. Teaching is hard. It is complex work and we must support our educators by focusing on the right work. This data demonstrates an intense need to pr improve tier one and tier two instruction. Next slide, please. Where did we start? We started with expectations. During the first face-to-face -face meeting with our educational leaders following the pandemic, we shared with them the district's leadership expectations. This was a first. 
crystal clear expectations for us to focus on students. These leadership expectations establish the way of the work. We work together as one team. We lead with students at the center of the work, making the right decisions for every child. We must demonstrate instructional leadership with high expectations for all students and all adults with the support they need. We have to be solution oriented and engage and collaborate with integrity and respect. Next slide, please. As a district, we are focusing on the right work. We are focusing on the instructional capacity of our educators. I have served in the Clark County School District since 1994. With Dr. Jar's leadership, we are focused on the right work. Our educators want to do their very best to support our students. They work extremely hard and are very dedicated. As a district, we have to support them with implementing high quality instruction by providing the instructional materials and resources and the professional learning necessary to improve student outcomes. For example, we did not have a common formative interim assessment in grades K through eight in math, English language arts, and science until 2019. We now have map growth, which provides us with three checkpoints throughout the school year to know where our students are in their learning in math, English language arts, and science. We did not have this information, which is essential for student success. We have to know where our students are in their learning to guide and inform instruction. We now have tier one instructional materials in math, science, and soon ELA. Our teachers have not had these resources in approximately the last 10 years. And due to the ESSER money, we are now able to purchase these instructional materials that are aligned to the Nevada academic content standards for our educators. The Board of School Trustees passed the district's first multi-tiered system of supports policy in December 2021, which requires every school to implement multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS, which is a framework for all students focusing on academics, social-emotional learning, and behavior. With Dr. Jar's leadership, we developed and implemented a professional learning division, which is solely dedicated to professional learning for our educators. This division has developed pathways for new teachers, teacher leaders, entry-level administrators, and aspiring principals. The work is focused on building strong, positive climate and culture while building instructional systems and structures, focusing on the alignment of the curriculum instruction and assessment. Last summer, we had required professional learning for all principals in which we rolled out common, clear expectations for high quality tier one instruction. Principals then replicated this professional learning for their educators at their schools. We also developed and implemented a teaching and learning cycle and consistent expectations and a framework for professional learning communities. And we are monitoring the work and holding each other accountable. Next slide, please. The teaching and learning unit in the last year and a half has developed a data-driven, instructionally focused, systemic monitoring cycle in which principal supervisors meet with principals to observe instruction, discuss timely student achievement data, and formulate next steps. Principal supervisors and principals work together to monitor the work and hold each other accountable for improving instruction to improve student outcomes. This comprehensive systemic mon monitoring cycle is a first in the Clark County School District supported by research. I am so proud to work alongside our principal supervisors and principals focusing on the right work for our students. Next slide, please. Coming out of the pandemic, we developed the differentiated school support framework. We analyzed school student achievement data and identified schools that were low performing, chronically low performing, and downward trending. 
We provided differentiated support to these schools, including frequent monitoring and the development of a supplemental school performance plan. Based on the participation of these schools in this framework in the 21-22 school year, 59% of the schools had academic point increases from the 1819 to the 2122 Nevada School Performance Framework. Of the same set of schools, 31% increased academic points earned by 10 or more points, double digits. The focus on students and schools most in need demonstrates early success as we work alongside educators to develop systems and structures to improve student outcomes. Next slide, please. In January 2023, we implemented the Transformation Network. The network includes 23 elementary schools serving students in need of intensive support. The Transformation Network is served by one region superintendent and one school associate superintendent who directly serve approximately 12 schools each to provide weekly touch points at the schools. The Transformation Network is also served with instructional coaches with strong expertise in English language arts and mathematics and high quality instruction. The transfer, excuse me, the transformation network includes enhanced resources, increased support, and a dedicated and responsive team to improve student outcomes for all students. Superintendent Jar, for the record, in closing, as we start wrapping up, I want to go back to, as we have continued to do, is go into research. Research is clear, the number one indicator for student success is the classroom teacher. The second is a building principal supporting a classroom teacher. So when you look at our workforce, when you look at our priorities, right now, when you consider our educators are the number one predictor for student success, I wanna go back into data points 1994 was the last school year that the Clark County School District opened fully staffed. 1994. It's not something that has just been the last five years, five, six, seven, eight, nine years, 1994. Last week, two weeks ago, at, as we were at this conference, I heard and our secretary mentioned and said a quote, and I believe it to be true. We don't, we are at the doorstep of a teacher shortage. What we are facing as a nation, as a state, as a community, is a teacher respect. And I think when you look at one of our priorities is updating and addressing our salary schedule for our educators. We were able to increase the starting teacher pay, working with our partners, but that's not enough. It is not just our starting teacher salary, it's our retention, it's how do we keep our hardworking teachers to stay in the classroom. And here are some data points, $24 million per 1% increase in the cost of living. Step increase is 36 million, our benefits are right there, and when you look at our planning time, it's at $3 million for the Clark County School District per minute. So this is the exercise that we're going and going through with our community right now. And I say, you're gonna help me <laughs> help the board as we move forward. When 83% of our budget is in salary and benefits in the Clark County School District. Senator Titus, I was here last week with my chief of police. And we went back to work, and he said, what do you need? So here's where we are. Since Wednesday of last week that I was here to today, we confiscated another gun, 28, this year. Lost two beautiful lives to gun violence in the Clark County School District from Wednesday to today. Two, too many. We need and we are 
expanding our police force. We need to. Our teachers can't teach. Our children don't feel safe. Adding a middle, an officer in our middle school, in our career technical academies, our specialty schools, and rotating our police officers one in every five. That's an estimate of $21 million. I love my job. I love the work we're doing. I've been outside. I've worked in multiple states before I got here. And I came because I believe in children. I believe in the 40,000 employees and the board as we move forward. I have seen the work and I have seen, if you focus on instruction, on the instructional core and our teachers, supporting our teachers, I've seen the needle move. So we are going to expand our differentiated school support. We've seen improvements. When you look at 97 one-star schools, it's not just necessarily adding more money, it's adding the support for our educators, it's adding the intentional monitoring systems, looking at data. When they say you focus too much on data, and I said because every single number there is a face and a child attached to that number. I am the product of a public school system that gave me an opportunity. I came to this country and I didn't speak English in the fourth grade with a single mother that raised us because she believed in education. So I am telling you that this work can be done, but I'm also going to tell you I can't do it alone. It's not a superhero. It's not all of us, it's all of us in this room. So I am so appreciative of us, of you giving us the space to come and share instead of he reading headlines. I know we read headlines, but here's what happens. Here's the real work. We need to find ways to add more time for our educators to plan. Leadership selection in our neediest schools. We can't continue to say, well, it's the popularity contest. I need folks that are supported and focus on children. Monitor what you expect. And I know all of you have a lot of pressure with the resources as a legislature, as an executive branch, all of us, all of us in this community. And we're here, this has been done in other places in urban America, and it can be done in the Clark County School District. We need performance metrics on the science of reading. We need to continue to invest in our teachers, set minimum requirements and objectives for kindergarten readiness, read by grade three. But I'm gonna tell you, as I've mentioned to all, it's not just retention. Retention, the research doesn't support it, but it's identifying. But moving them on doesn't, doesn't help either. So what support systems do we put in place for children in the third grade that are not proficient? We can work together to address some of those gaps. Our high school preparation. We are working today, not today, but we're working with our principals recently in setting goals around advanced placement, around dual credit, around middle school mathematics, at high school courses in middle school. Our children can do it because we've seen it and the research supports it. And what are the graduation requirements? How do we hold our young people, our children accountable to set metrics so we know that they are ready to go? I don't know what that means. That's for somebody else to decide. But we want to be part of that conversation and have an evaluation system that is conducive to teaching and learning and professional growth. Because right now, when you look at our data that we just shared with you, 99, 98% of our educators in the Clark County School District are effective and highly effective, but our children are not performing. So there's something wrong. How do we look at that together to address that? We're going to continue to add school supervisors. Our research right now, our current school asso uh, associate superintendents are one, 
to 20 to 25. Our research by the Wallace Foundation, the premier organization on principal and principal and principal supervisors is one to 12. So we have to add school associate superintendents for that coaching, that ongoing conversation. So in closing, this is where I would tell you our North Star. Instructional capacity, high quality instruction, professional learning, monitoring, 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 and accountability from the classroom all the way to the superintendent's office to the state. I'm gonna tell you there could be another superintendent here tomorrow with a hybrid board, an appointed board, an advisory board. If we don't change an entire system, we will all be here having the same conversations two years from now. As we continue to get an update from our community, as my board president mentioned, tomorrow at two o'clock is our last community input. But what we're learning is that we need to do more. We need to speak to our community, educate them in what's happening. We started our bargaining conversations Yesterday was our first one with CCEA. We have support staff coming and our administrators union. Prioritize our budget, bring that to the board next Wednesday, and present the tentative budget to the Board of Trustees on the 13th. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity, and we'll stand ready for answering any of your questions. Thank you. I know there's a number of members that probably have a number of questions. Um, my children attended school in the Clark County School District, and I have family members who are educators in the Clark County School District. My district is in Clark County, and I have a number of questions from constituents um, from Clark County. I'm gonna let members ask questions. I'm gonna go through every question that was sent to me by the constituents, but as a black mama in Clark County, um, I'd like to go, before I go to the members, to 15 through 17. My children fit in both the black and African-American and Hispanic um, classifications. There are two or more races. When I look at 15 through 17, you're failing my children. It didn't start this school year. It's been there for a while. And your statement in your presentation that we were at a, a critical point, a call for action, when I look at the graphs, why was it not a call for action in 2018 because the numbers on every graph have black and especially English language learner students at the bottom cortex. Why wasn't it a call for action five years ago so that these children, these numbers didn't improve? Why now? What took this long? And then on top of that, when you look at the educators in the classroom, how many black and brown educators are there so that those black and brown children have someone that looks like them, that's educating them, that comes from the same shared life experiences? And maybe my career was in law enforcement, but my job, I didn't need to be in a classroom. Maybe there would be less police in the schools or you would feel you need less police in the schools if you had people who understood those shared life experiences that these children are going through, that's not a behavioral issue. I'll stop there and you can answer those. Thank you, Madam Chair, and great question. Um, I can speak for my arrival. When I, when I, I came in June 19th of 2018, that was when I walked into the school district and I interviewed for the job, I was, I was, I was, um, and I applied interview. When I looked at the data then, there was a call to action in my, in my set of expectations, because I have seen black children, I have seen Latino children, I have seen children perform at the highest level 
when given the resources. So it's been documented because it's been public. And I, and, I, and I shared with you before this meeting, and, and I'll let my deputy speak to that because she's lived it. There has been, and I'll be candid with you, there has been an adult-driven expectation and support in protecting adults versus protecting children in the Clark County School District for the history, at least since I witnessed before. No more. That's why when we looked at the expectations that we set before uh, coming out of COVID, we didn't have any of these systems. So there was an adult-driven culture to protecting adults, protecting special interests versus protecting our children. So I'm going to stop you because it's getting late. <laughs> I need you to just answer the question. I did. No, you did not. What are you doing? What is the plan to help increase the outcomes for all children in Clark County, but specifically for those that we are failing? What is that plan? I understand that there's been an adult driven or whatever, but education is about the kids, mm -hmm. right? And it's having the educators in the classrooms taking care of those educators, taking care of the support staff to take care of the kids. Just in short, what's the plan? It's right here. Progress monitoring, holding adults accountable to make sure that they're serving children, providing them the resources to make sure that children and educators have the resources so they can learn. Speaker Yeager. Superintendent Jar, for the record. I'm sorry, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I would be lying if I didn't say the performance metrics are extraordinarily depressing. Um, worse than I thought when I saw those graphs, and, and I share the concerns um, of the chair. And I guess before I ask questions, I just, I, I wanted to note, um, I did pull up this document, I think this was put together by the National Association of School Superintendents, um, the Invest in Education document. And I'll just note on there, this obviously came out before the budget came out, and it was um, talking about a substantial increase of $271 million in the next fiscal year in education funding. Um, obviously, we're at four times that amount with the governor's budget. It talked about fully funding the weights and how we need to do that, and we're at a point where I think we're, we're going to do that. So I just wanted to point out that this document, I read this document to be very hopeful based on an amount of funding that we're quadrupling. Um, I certainly understand the challenges, the, the numbers you presented, and, and so I guess, you know, one of the questions I had, and We've talked about it at a high level, and I know you're still in this budgeting process, but I was looking at, I was looking for in here is what, what are the specific things you're going to do to increase achievement? And the one I wanted to ask about was on page 13, if you can go back to that one, please. Uh, this was the fiscal year breakdown. And I wanted to ask about that additional 15 minutes for classroom personnel per day. Can you tell me what that is, and is that something, because it's expensive, I think you said it's about three million per minute. Is this something that we would expect to see uh, improve achievement and proficiency in our students? Superintendent Jar, for the record, Speaker Yeager, that is um, what we are hearing from our educators is they need 15 minutes. Uh, it, it would be additional time for educators to plan their instruction, so it will not be with children. And if I could follow up, and I guess just the, the follow-up to that would be, um, I understand that, but I'm, I'm assuming that there's some evidence behind that, that that's going to help those teachers be more effective in the classroom, which is then going to lead to improved proficiency by the students. Superintendent Jeff, for the record, speaker, yes. Okay. Um, a couple other questions, if I could, Madam Chair. I'll just ask a couple. I have a lot, but I know it's late, and a lot of other members have questions. Um, I wanted to ask, and if you don't have this information, that's fine, but I just wanted to know uh, how much money the district spends on testing annually uh, between MAPS, iReady, SBAC Science. I mean, there's a whole certain number of testing. I don't know if you have that number today, but would be interested to know what that number is on an annual basis. Um, I do share some concerns, and I know that the state is not blameless here, but that we, we do too much too much testing. And so, you know, to me, that's a place where we might be able to save some, some money. So 
no need to answer unless you know that right off your head. Okay, and then um, just a couple more. Um, I think in the last year or so, with I think with some of the ESSER funds, perhaps there was an increase in starting pay for teachers, I believe. But what we constantly heard, I don't say constantly, but what I heard from folks in my um, district were the veteran teachers didn't feel the love because they didn't see that increase. And so I understand you're in a little bit of a conundrum, right? You need to hire new people and you've got to raise that salary. But is there a plan and in this document you gave us is part of that to somehow address the veteran pay so there's not that I guess decreasing gap between starting and veteran pay superintendent jar for the record speaker Jaeger um, great question and and we use our as I was noted we use our 23 million from our reserves for the starting teacher pay um, and we use ESSER for an incentive which then um, caused a little bit of the challenge, and that's part of when you look at in the presentation, and I don't see the slide, slide 27, when you look at the salary schedule to address that issue of our veteran teachers, which is something that we're hearing as well, and so is our board, it's about $100 million uh, to update that entire salary schedule. And then, Madam Chair, the last one I'll ask for now, if you'll let me, is... Um I just wanted to ask about the, the Title I designation because I know there was, a, I believe, an article about it, and I, I got some questions about um, change. I, I, I don't want to – it's late on a Friday night, but essentially schools that used to be Title I, some of them are not Title I. Maybe there's more. Maybe there's less. But I think the concern I heard was that um, in making that decision, some schools aren't going to get as many resources as other schools. And so I just uh, kind of wanted to hear um, – I guess the justification for making that determination and for how we may be able to answer to our constituents about what's happening. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Jeff, for the record. Um, Speaker Yeager, great question. The 47 schools that lost Title I money, we, um, when I came here, um, we, we were allocating 40 up to the schools that were down to 40%. We brought it up to 60% because it was to really provide more resources to where there's the greatest needs. Uh, with a plan to bring it up to 75 percent where we have generational poverty and a lot of the challenges that schools will be able to do that um, so we did uh, and when we looked at the schools across the 47 schools they have carryover dollars uh, within their within their strategic budget that they will be able to provide resources um, for their for their students so they don't lose out on the title one thank you senator neal Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know folks have a lot of questions, so where am I starting? So I want to start with, I, before I go there, so on the mental health services slide, um, it, you had $77 million and you mentioned Hazel Health. Did How much of this went to uh, Hazel Health? Superintendent Jar, for the record, I'll have to get that. I don't have the exact dollar amount. Is Hazel Health, were they, were they supposed to offer free services to students? Or was it for fee? Can I turn it over to Dr. Barton, who's in Vegas? Dr. Barton? Uh, thank you, Superintendent. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, through you to uh, Senator Neal, uh, to address the question regarding the $77 million investment, uh, Hazel... Uh, there is, there are components of Hazel where there is billing for, for Medicaid, um, but that service, um, I, I got to get you the full dollar amount as far as what that entails with the 77 million, but that's part of the overall ecosystem with combining Hazel Health with, with just telehealth, which with Care Solace. So we'll have to get you the numbers on that, Senator, if it's okay. So while you're getting the numbers, can you also find out, because it's my understanding that they were charging parents $75 in order to be seen? So, so, that that is, that's the first that I've heard of it, Senator Neal. I'll have to look into that fact because uh, I'm, I'm of, the, of the understanding that this is an ESSER investment, and I, that's the first that I've heard of that. That was my understanding, too. It came from a counselor. So um, I wanted to ask about I'll look about into that right away. Okay. So my next question is um, you talked a lot about the uh, – community programs, tutoring, and summer learning opportunities. Um, and 
there's really no data here, but I'm wondering how many schools actually engaged in the summer learning opportunities because there were schools that last summer um, said that they were no longer a part of the funding, that the funding for summer program was during the 2020 2021, but not 2022, and that they were responsible for figuring that out with their own budget. For the record, Brenda Larson Mitchell, summer acceleration um, has been, it, we've had that at every school, elementary, middle, and high school, and we paid for it out of ESSER funds. Okay. So, all right. I'm hearing differently, and it's actually one of the schools that um, we have worked on together, which was Matt Kelly, and they had to pay for their own summer school. It was not ESSER dollars that um, she said was paying for it. Um, the other question that I had was, what is the progress that you have made in developing your comprehensive literacy plan for K-12? This is in your Focus 2020-2024 plan uh, that originated from 2019. Dr. Mansell? Thank you for the question. Uh, for the record, Dustin Mansell, our comprehensive literacy plan that we have been working on, we have just worked alongside all of our principals and we received feedback from our teachers regarding the literacy frameworks for kindergarten through second grade and again through second through third, and then fourth through fifth. Within those frameworks, we have broken down the direct instruction along with the small group uh, literacy block and differentiation. Within those frameworks, it also scaffolds the understanding of delivering high quality tier one instruction. Our next steps regarding that framework or the plan is the adoption of a tier one ELA curriculum, which will occur on Monday through Wednesday of next week. Once we have that curriculum adopted uh, and it goes to the board for approval for purchase, then we can begin finalizing the plan to support our teachers with developing and delivering high quality tier one instruction, which means the plan would be about ready uh, in time for the curriculum to roll out to support our teachers this fall. Thank you for that because and Madam Chair, can I have a follow up? So on the curriculum, um, then this kind of, it kind of dovetails into it. So you guys mentioned that you've purchased a lot of curriculum. And I was wondering if, um, clearly you can't give the list today, but if you could give the list to the committee on what you've actually purchased around the curriculum materials for ELA math. Um, because it's my understanding that some of the online programs that you have invested in, don't necessarily, well, they're not the equivalent to an actual curriculum, and but they're being used in the schools to replace actual curriculum. And then, Madam Chair, one final question, and I know other people have a lot. Are you going to get an answer on this one, or are you uh, just building the list? <laughs> I'm collecting, Madam Chair, I'm collecting a list. Okay. On this one, I, so I can give her all the different ones that we have. Okay. Go ahead. So the final question, so in your amended budget for 22-23, the document states that you're expected to have a $1 million increase uh, in uh, decrease in special education, and you and it was stated that it was the state educa education funding that you projected this decrease because of a result of the aligning revenue from NDE's final special education allocation. And so, what I wanted to know is, you are you receive federal allocation for special ed, correct? So, how do you expect to offset this one million dollar decrease with this increased funding or other? funds Senator Neal I'm looking for where the 1 million did I'm looking for where so, you see that So in your budget let me pull the page page 11 or um in your budget I believe it is on so it's on your revenue state assumption state projections and assumptions page the actual document doesn't actually have page numbers. It's in your open book. This is your open book 
on CCSD website and I can only tell you the title of the page because the pages do not have page numbers. Okay, so it's not up because I'm so it's sorry. Not it's this not in this presentation. presentation. It's on Mr. your Howie. open book website where you have your amended 2022-2023 budget. Jason Gaddy, for the record, um, I, be I believe the question is how, how, how are we going to fund that, that deficit uh, based off the change in, in funding for special education? Correct. That will be funded out of our general fund. We do have a transfer out of our general fund um, to cover any shortfalls in the special education fund to ensure that that always balances and that we um, have expended all the IEP required spending. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Senator Neal, you sparked my interest, and um, I hadn't read the report that she was referring to. Um, my understanding is is that the um, one shot from the last legislative session for the TOTS program that was going directly to uh, the special education children's, that was one shot, and that's gone away, but, but we're now, so that was roughly $5 million that's now being lost to these students. Um, and I, I'm hearing there's another million dollars that's going to be lost. I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but these students probably need more money, not less money. Jason Getty, for the record, so I'm, I'm not familiar with the TOTS because that'll be handled in the grants piece, so I'd have to get more specifics on that. Um, but w when we say we lose revenue, it's not, it, it's, it's, we're allocated from the state based off of, uh, the, the, the enrollment as, as well as what's available within the budget. Um, and so we don't have control over losing or gaining those, those funds. We take what we do. And then because special education is, is legally mandated um, through all the IEPs, that just means that we have less money within our general fund um, in order to serve general students to make sure that we meet those obligations. And then I just would encourage you to, to, to do follow up on this because now I'm we're not just talking about what Senator Neal mentioned, it's a million dollars, but we're actually talking about $6 million potentially uh, that you'll need to dip into the general fund to um, try to help the, our special needs students. And thank you, Madam Chair, sorry for... It's okay. <laughs> no problem. Assemblywoman Bacchus. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I have two questions. One may be appropriate for the Dep Deputy Superintendent because um, you raised something that was quite of interest, but I want to start this preface that I'm a proud graduate of the Clark County School District. I went kindergarten through 12th grade, and that was many years ago, obviously, but I'm hearing about all of these tests that these kids are taking, and we now just added this growth measurement testing three times throughout the year. Um, and I'm someone who is not the greatest test taker, but I'm one of your honors kids. I'm one of your kids who graduated as a distinguished scholar back in the days, um, went on to college and law school, and I always frown upon standardized tests. I don't think it's a good measurement, but what I had were teachers in the classroom who saw my ability to succeed. When my standardized testing, I think it was going into junior high at the time, were maybe not so great, my teachers were the one that pushed me and put me in advanced placement classes. So. I get nervous when you guys rely so much on this data. We don't have enough time in the classroom as it is, so I wish we could shift back to teaching versus all of these standardized tests. And I know there's all the no child left behind that's happened subsequent to me graduating, so I'm kind of sad about this growth measurement stuff on top of it. Um, but I wanted to, my real question, so I guess, Deputy, you don't need to answer a question, but I saw in here the educator pipeline. Um, I know we have a great deficit of teachers and. The problem was I had friends who graduated in the 90s. They left the field of teaching to go do something else, even back then. Um, but today, I, I wanted to know hear more about the investment that was going on with UNLV. I saw that it was on page slide six. Superintendent Ajar, for the record. Um, so that is where we are funding for opportunities for support staff build our own program to go through UNLV. I know the state does some, and then we're also investing in that as well. Um, the other one that is, um, so, so that's that for support staff. One of the things that we're also, and, and really excited, we, 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 the board approved it in December, um, and we, are, we used three, we granted $3 million to Nevada State College, soon to be it's Nevada State University, um, to pay for, students in their 
education program that graduated from the Clark County School District Teacher Academies we, to pay their tuition uh, in an effort to recruit them into our schools as well. And, and, Matt, and Chair, may I have a follow-up? Um, with that, have you seen the rate of return on those um, teachers? I don't know if we've gotten to the point where they've graduated and come and taught at Clark County School District yet. We, we can get the, the exact numbers. I know that anecdotally um, it's been very popular. And I know that there is a huge need and, um, for more resources because there's more applicants than there is dollars at this point. And not only us, but then also from the State Department, from NDE. Thank you. Chair Don darrell -Lute. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, you told me, you just said that you gave $3 million to Nevada State College, and I'm, I'm aware of that program. But, and I know that there's been other output from the Clark County School District, and I struggled just a little bit because we're not a foundation, and we have so many needs and then we're giving money to these other entities. And while I recognize there might be return for some of this, I just feel like we can't be in that business. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if you can tell me why we're in that business of giving away money when, when we are not in that business. <laughs> Superintendent Jeff, for the record, great question, um, Chair. On there a loop. I think it, uh, when we partnered with Nevada State College, it was for our children, our own kids, uh, building our own, and it would help them hurry up and graduate faster as we're paying their tuitions to take more classes. Um, with their, you know, this is where an opportunity could be for others, but it was, you know, resources that we had from the federal government. It was to expedite, you know, because we have other pipeline efforts, but I need, I need teachers today. Um, and this was an effort for us to look at and expedite that process to get teachers in our classrooms. Is there a requirement that they come back to us, like a, a witchy? Is there a requirement? Because if we're giving money to, and, and believe me, I would be the last one to say, don't give money to UNLV, NSC, whoever they are. Public Education Foundation, I don't care who it is, but if there's not a requirement that they come back to us, like a witchy, I, I just, I, I'm, I, I'm struggling. We're yeah. trying to find money for you, and yet you're giving it away on the street corner, so to speak. So, uh, Superintendent Jeff, for the record, Chair Dundara Loop, it's a, it's a great concern, um, you know, and I'd have to chime in with Dr. Barton, but when I look at it, it's more giving the kids paying the kids' tuition, um, looking at the kids um, in our schools. When you, that's, that's how I saw it. I, I, now I see your point, but I'm, I'm seeing it more, and I'm helping a student pay their last two years of their education. But Dr. Barton, do we have, I know we've had some conversations about um, a requirement, but um, I'll have Dr. Barton chime in on that one. Mike Barton, for the record, uh, through you, Chair, to uh, Senator Amer uh, Dondero Loop. Uh, there is not an official uh, legal document for these students uh, to commit to come teach for the Clark County School District. The reason for that being uh, that was not allowed per the grant through the federal government. However, working with uh, Nevada State closely, there's definitely a recruitment effort, ongoing meetings happening with those students uh, every few weeks, frankly. And we're seeing that with Nevada State students, they do tend to come back to the Clark County School District. So we are going to heavily rely on that recruiting effort, that one-to-one -one interaction with our human resources personnel to ensure that they stay with us outside of an official legal agreement. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barton, and it's great to see you. Um, I. I just, I get that it might not have been the, the money process, but I just feel like if, if, if we're going to be giving away school district dollars, I don't care how they came in. I don't care whether the state gave them to you, the federal government gave them to you. I don't, if we're not going to be servicing those kids that 
we've got in front of us, and I, and I, like I said, I, it is not lost on me. I 100% am behind NSC. I think they have a great program. Dr. Dockweiler couldn't be of more, I mean, she's a wonderful person. The UNLV programs, I can go on and on and on. But if we can't service our kids, if we are short millions of dollars for our kids, then we can't do that business, that's all. And, and um, I've got about three other questions, but I, I have to say one other thing. And I said it on Saturday as well to someone. I, it hurts my heart, truly. It hurts my heart when I hear people say, well, when I got here, when I got here. You know, there's not, uh, Miss Larson Mitchell, Dr. Barton, uh, Dr. Mansell, myself, we were all here before you were here. And while I appreciate everything you're trying to change or do or, you know, strategically, I would no more um, criticize anything anybody did um, before you got here because I, I, I know Dr. Larson Mitchell and I know Dr. Barton and I know these people and I know they and myself did everything we could for the Clark County School District and I can go back like to the beginning of time and I said it on Saturday, there is not a person in education that doesn't do it, in my opinion, for the right reason. And it just, it, it truly hurts my heart when I hear someone say, well, you know, when I got here, well, you know, when I got here, but I don't sit around saying when I got here. So um, that you don't need to comment on that. Um, it just um, is, I guess it's a little bit of a rub for me because I've been a Clark County supporter and a Clark County student, a mom, a grandma, a teacher, a you name it, and I've been there for that district. So I just um, hate to throw the stones. Thank you very much. Thank you. Assemblywoman Gorlo. Thank you, Chair. Um, like my colleagues, I have lots of questions. I'm a mom as well and um, have two kids that have gone through, well, one graduated last year from the Clark County School District, the other one's a junior. And to kind of touch a little bit on what my colleague was talking about, those grant funds, I guess my thought would be, why would you not invest that in our current teachers and invest in them and retain them, um, helping those that might have the ARL um, license get to be a full licensed teacher or someone to get to be a master's. Maybe someone wants to go from elementary to um, high school but can't do that because they need to go back to school. So that would have been something that she just touched on, but I don't want that to be my question. So it's up to you if you want to answer that. My question's more on, again, teacher retention and overcrowding. Many of these classrooms have way more than what they're supposed to have of student teacher ratio. And we've legislated and said, hey, don't put any more than this. But then there's lots of waivers that go out and these schools still have more kids. Sometimes, you know, one and a half times. My kids, and I know you guys weren't here, but guess what, you're here now. So I'm pointing the finger at you guys. My kids went to an elementary school that was built for 800. It had almost 1,600 kids in it. The middle school in my district had 2,400 kids in it. I have been promised a high school since my kids were two and four. Did I tell you my daughter that was four is now in college and this high school is supposed to be opened in 27 when she will have graduated from college. That was bonded for in 2019 and again in 21. So I know it's not just my district. There's a lot of schools out there that need fixing. They need new schools. Can you help me out with my district at least? <laughs> what the, what, I almost said bad words, sorry. <laughs> when are we gonna see this school? Superintendent Jar for the record, and, um, and I understand and, and, and I appreciate the feedback on the when I got here comment, and, and I duly noted, I, I, I get the sensitivity, Senator, so thank you for that reminder. Um, so 
when you, I need to know the district first. <laughs> if I can, uh, chair, Madam, Madam Chair. Sorry, it's 35, which is Mountain's Edge and Southern Highlands. So Desert Oasis is there in Southern Highlands. The yep. other high school yeah. is Sierra Vista, both of which are overcrowded. Yeah. I mean, give our students a break, give our teachers a break. We've got to do something. And again, I understand it's not just my district. It is it's, all over Clark County. It but is. So I, I'd have to go back and we can get that to you, um, Assemblywoman. I think that's uh, on, on the exact timeline for, for that comprehensive. Uh, one of the things that we are obviously is we've invested in the last two years, 10 million, I believe, um, Mr. Gowdy, 10 million and 15 million of our budget in, in, in deferred maintenance up. And this is one of the things that we need to um, invest heavily. We, we haven't taken care of our buildings and we're looking at a $50 million, which is not in totality what we need. That's one. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate the legislature last session on the bond. Um, where we have uh, 13 elementary schools that are slated and 33 full renovation projects moving forward. One of the things that you're going to be the first to know in this committee and whoever is watching, one of the conversations we're looking at and having is because of the birth rate, do we need elementary schools because we are really struggling in our high school overcrowdedness. So that's, those are conversations that are ongoing, but I'll, we'll, we'll get back to you on that exact, on that school. I would appreciate that because I've been asked to be on those emails previously and nobody lets me know when a meeting's coming or what's going on with it. And it's been very frustrating not to get any, any idea. And if I may, just one other quick question. This one's much easier, hopefully. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you've done $52 million, you've spent $52 million on community programs and tutoring. Um, could you just elaborate a little bit on what that tutoring looks like? Because I know that I've received emails about a paper system and I've contacted them personally three times and they've never responded. So what other kind of programs are you looking at? Because my community's not seeing it, and I'm sure others aren't either. So, um, Superintendent Jar, for the record, yes, it is the 20, it's paper. It's the, the, the once that's one of the programs that we have for all students where it's available um, online 24 7, as Dr. Enfield um, talked about, is the same one that we have um, in the Clark County School District. The last um, couple of weeks ago, we, we had conversations with our principals about making sure that the communication goes out to parents um, to be able to. to provide a, a, a resource that we're invested. That's one. The other ones on community partners is where we allocated grants uh, for nonprofits that are doing some tutoring or support for kids um, within their jurisdiction, if you will. Thank you, Madam Chair. One just quick comment. For $52 million, I should get an email back. Well, <laughs> noted that. Assemblyman Miller. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, I have a question here regarding um, what's well, in the mental health space, and I realize that you all you mentioned that you spent $77 million on mental health um, with the different programs, and I realize that we have to get some information back based on that. Uh, Senator Neal's question regarding Hazel Health. Um, I will say before I go into my question, I am, uh, I, I guess, a little taken back by the number of people who are here to represent and the amount of times that we've gotten, we have to get back to you. Um, I feel like you've come with the most robust team and a lot of these questions um, we should probably be able to get uh, some quicker answers to. Nonetheless, um, I'm curious about, I noticed that you have 21 million um, for additional police officers to go to be a part of every school. Um, I'm curious to know, do we have mental health professionals in every school? Dr. Barton? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, through you, Chair, to Assemblyman uh, Miller, 
To, to address uh, the first fact, Hazel Health, uh, just to get back to you on that, it's 2.5 million annually for the contract, and, and to Senator Neal's point. Um, as far as ha having mental health professionals in every school, uh, we have a, a multitude of professionals. We have counselors, we have social workers, school psychologists. Uh, do we have enough of them? No. So to your point, Assembly Miller, I, but I think we have representation at every campus, whether it's a counselor, social worker, or a mixture of, of both of them. Okay. Or if, if a school does not have a counselor, they definitely have a plan to use a partnering school counselor for that resource. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I guess I, I'm, I'm um, do we have, and you may need to pause and come back to me, an idea of what that type of program costs or what it would look like to have even a psychologist um, more readily accessible to schools that um, maybe need more support. Uh, and the reason that I'm asking this based on the, the request or the suggestion of putting a CCSD police officer at every school is I realize that's to address safety, but I don't know if adding a police officer to every school actually addresses safety. Um, I don't know if it addresses the concern of feeling safe in the classroom as a student or a teacher. And I would um, probably consider how much more could we invest in mental health um, to create a safer environment versus police officers. Um, and so I guess maybe that's turning into more of a statement than a question. Um, or, but maybe you, can, maybe you can shine some light on the decision to put a police officer in every school versus potentially expanding the mental health um, plan. And I appreciate you all acknowledging that you put $77 million into mental health. That is significant. Um, I think we could probably um, see a greater breakdown of that at some point. I'm not asking anybody to do it right now, but <laughs> I would like to see what that looks like broken down. So thank you. Senator Wynn. Thank you, and if I can just kind of direct you back to slide 26 on there. And so you said on slide 26 that this was so important to put on a slide during this presentation, that the research shows that teachers are the single most important school-based determinant of school success, student success. And then when you were asked by the chair what your solutions were, you blamed this adult-driven approach, which I'm assuming you're insinuating that it is a teacher or adult-driven approach there. And that your additional solution was to, to these incredibly depressing statistics that we just saw, was that we need to hold adults accountable. So unless are are you talking about adults being held accountable being parents or are you talking adults being accountable the teachers or are you talking about adults being accountable yourself um, it just seems incredibly inconsistent and additionally if we go back to that slide again and i'm looking at it right here it further states that if a teacher's success is deeply linked to the effectiveness of the principal and their ability to create an environment where teachers can thrive. So there's that direct correlation, single most important thing is our teachers, our educators, and how they are supported. So my question is, what are you doing to support and coach these teachers? What are you doing to support what the research shows on this slide that is the single most important determinant of student success? And what are you doing to make sure that these adults are getting that? Um, and how is your administration being accountable for those teachers and their success? Superintendent Jar, for the record, great question, Senator. Um, I'll go back and um, the, the resources that we're providing for professional billing, the $36 million for our educators, that's one when we're providing the academic instructional materials for teachers to teach, that's another one. Um, I wish I could lower class size. Uh, that is a, that is, that is a long-term need that needs to happen. Our classes, our class sizes are way too large. Um, those are the things. We added a professional learning, as my deputy talked about, a professional learning division 
um, so we can invest and provide that ongoing professional learning for our teachers and our building principals to support teachers. So, so those are the strategies that I am talking about, um, about the support, just because that's what the research calls for. Um, when I met the, and, and, and maybe to help clarify, um, I would say on the, on the adult, um, I meant the, uh, and, and if I can, um, it's the outside adult pressures that are not conducive to supporting this very same research that is provided right here in front of you. May I follow up, Chair? I, I guess the tone of this presentation seems like we were blaming adults and the only adults are these adult interests seem to be things, you know, I, I can't get a straight answer, so I'm not sure. I'm assuming you're, a, a, you know, you're talking about outside interests, so it, it seems adult centered and you're not talking about parents, so it seems like you're talking about teachers and, you know, I don't see that. I see that you want an additional, like, money for um, more associate superintendents. You want more administrative and supervisory employees. Um, and it seems less teacher-centered and more administrative-centered. Superintendent Jar, for the record. Um, so I apologize if it seems that way, because it's not. It's really to provide the support. So um, I'll take that as as whether it's constructive criticism or not, um, I'll take it as criticism, period, or, or feedback. Um, that's not what it's meant to be, because when you really look at the workforce and you look at the number one bullet is the salary schedule of the educator in the classroom. That is, to me, that is, as Superintendent Enfield and my colleagues said, that is the priority. If we don't have teachers in schools, then we, and ch to support our children, we don't have a school system. So I apologize if that was the tone. Didn't mean it to be that way. And, you know, and, and that's kind of the way I took it because we kept talking about this adult-centered, adult-driven, holding adults accountable. And unless you're the adult that we're talking about holding accountable, you know, or the administrators or the teachers, I'm not sure who we're directing that, like, attention towards. And that's kind of how it came across. That was the first, like, answer to a solution on what we do about these horrible statistics that we're facing. And it's getting away from this adult-driven, adults being held accountable. It's in your little, like, you know, wheel there that was on the slide. So um, I would like to see more of that support going towards, directly towards those teachers, um, if they are the single most important school-based determinant of student success. Thank you. Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and um, I'd like to go back to slide 21 if possible, uh, but it is going to be along the same lines as um, my, uh, the prior questions, but this time I'm, I'm, as an educator myself, I'm gonna let somebody else answer this time. Uh, so President Garcia Morales, if you could possibly explain to me, um, and this has to do with, I'm gonna try to use the bottom word of accountability there, doing just a small amount of research. What role did the board have when Superintendent Jara made the decision to give a very large raise? to executive committees in November of 2021 that would have been equal to some of our first year teachers. What role did the Clark County School District Board of Trustees have in that decision and or in, in, in uh, following conversations? Evelyn Garcia Morales for the record. Thank you for your question, Assemblywoman Anderson. The board has a huge responsibility when it comes to student outcomes, our focus, when we focus on student outcomes and um, have priorities that are clear, crystal clear, when it comes to goals um, that help us measure the success of our district, I mean, those are absolutely critical. Now, when it comes to the um, increases, which you referenced, you know, I have to, sh I have to share with you, actually, um, you know, I recognize the, the media and the attention that that uh, decision that was a day-to-day -day decision uh, that was made. I think one thing that's missing from this conversation is that the 
often uh, oftentimes it's it, you know we, we talk about look we want to increase raises for employees across the district uh, that it's needed uh, we have to increase the salary schedule there are bargaining units involved um, that require negotiations and um, you know the board of trustees hires a superintendent to make decisions that are difficult um, to improve student outcomes. I think it's really uh, challenging to honestly, um, I think one thing, uh, there are a lot of things that are missing, honestly, the conversations. This conversation, you know, this moment that happened uh, almost two years ago, there are pressing needs that exist in our community right now um, that are across the entire school district. Um, traditionally, uh, our education system has been underfunded uh, and under-resourced. Uh, my intention is not to blame anyone. It is just a, a cold fact. And um, everybody deserves increases across the board. And Thank you for that. And, and I understand. As you can tell, I'm... I'm uh, pretty upset about it because that happened two years ago, and yet if I were to utilize the data, where exactly does that then help in the high school achievement science scores or the mathematics scores when uh, these individuals, such as the chief financial officer's raise was $44,000, or the information officer who should actually be helping with um, making a source of pride and a positive culture to work in Clark County School District, where exactly are they helping in that? And I'm more than happy to have anybody answer that question as to how exactly the information officer is creating a positive culture in our school districts, and more importantly, for the educators and support professionals who work at Clark County School Dr. District. Dr. Jara, actually, I, I th forgive me, uh, Trustee Garcia, Mora Evelyn Garcia Morales, for the record, I can't get um, trustee out of my system. It is just in it. Um, and I, I know you want to answer that, but I, um, I think it's really important that we have really honest conversations about how our school systems have been funded and underfunded. I recognize that you want very specific answers to uh, how a chief information officer, for example, who develops um, infrastructure for a school district, that um, if you compare it to um, a, um, a private sector employer, I mean, everybody in, in, in education is underpaid, including your school board of trustees. I spent I spent, um, I spent a significant amount of time and energy in this position in order to support outcomes for our students, to support my colleagues. I, t I have a full-time job, you know, um, and I appreciate the question when it comes to uh, whether we are paying people enough. The answer is no. And this body has the power to increase budgets across the entire board. I recognize that it's not an easy decision and it's not an easy conversation, but I, I mean, if we wanna talk about money, we, we have to look at everything. Uh, thank you, so, and I understand that that's a difficult thing to put you into, but quite frankly, you're, you're not answering the question right now. And I am speaking right now on behalf of educators who I have spoken with from Clark County School District. They do not feel supported they are hearing about rumors or otherwise about boxes of unopened and unused supplies. They are leaving the schools and they are excellent educators and they don't want to be here. And I understand that these are not easy answers, but at some point you're going to have to answer them. At what point will you actually put the money into the classrooms and talk with your school organization teams, which by the way, this is the only school district that has, and you have yet to mention them. You've spent $6.7 million on a new dashboard. You've spent how much on a human, human capital resource, and yet these are all just, it feels like from what I'm seeing, outside contracts that are not helping the people in the classroom or driving the buses or helping our students. What is your plan? Superintendent Jar, for the record, thank you, Assemblywoman Anderson, for the question. And if I may ask um, the answer the question on the on the raises, I, I did. I um, I work with the board. I shared the data with the board when I did a comp analysis. 
which as a matter of fact, similar to Superintendent Enfield, we're doing a comprehensive um, compensation analysis for all our employees as well. Uh, we raised teacher salaries to 50,000 looking and using our, our, our carryover, uh, not our carryover, our, our reserves because of the crisis that we have in the classroom when it comes to supporting our educators. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I didn't want to reference the SOT because last time there was criticism about me, you know, complaining about 486. Um, there's $91 million in school supplies and school carryover budget and school budgets that I can't touch. So the message is very clear. Why are teachers buying materials when there's $91 million in school for supply money? When you, when you, so that's, that's one, right? So, so the other one, and, 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 I, and, I, and I think this is important also as well when you talk about the boxes, because I was in schools, um, and I was in a school, and um, when I walk around and I saw a bunch of boxes, very similar for math curriculum. Well, we purchased six years, right? So, because I, I sent a text to my deputy and to Dustin Mansell, and I say, why do we have boxes? <laughs> we, we purchased the six years of curriculum, up in our schools. So they have them, they just have minimal space to store them. So I think, so So thank you for the question so I can add clarity um, to that, but those are some of the decisions that are made. So the materials are, they're not being used because it's for the next six years. Members, any other questions? Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to change the pace a little bit for you. First of all, I don't really want to hear about what your trustees make or don't make. Just like we did, we volunteered for these jobs. We worked hard to get elected to these jobs. 